I'm James Francis and Darren Renko. And I think to start the meeting, why don't we just introduce ourselves so that they know who's counselor and who's town manager. And so I'm Cindy Maynard, I'm council chair. Anyone else? I'm Tom Perry and I'm a council member. Sam Cheryl Coon. Robertson, council member. Sam Coon, council member. Lori Osher, council member. Terry Green, your council member. And I'm Megan Gardner, council member. Sophie Wilson, town manager. Great, thank you. So um, I've asked James and, and Darren to kind of talk to us a little bit about um, Chief Orno. This came about because we were looking at revamping some signs and, and doing a little bit more um, promotion uh, on the town of Orno and I thought we should understand what the history is behind Orno and, and why we should be proud of it and what we should be promoting. So I don't know, James, if you want to talk or Darren, I, I don't know how you want to start this, but. In, in our brief conversation before this, we, we agreed that I'd go first. Okay. Only because I know uh, James is, is much more expert on this area than I am. Um, so I think people know who I am. I'm Darren Ranko. I'm chair of Native American programs um, at the University of Maine. I'm a citizen of the Penobscot Nation and was a graduate of Orono High School, class of 89. So that will make uh, Mr. Perry feel, feel good. Without him, who knows where I'd be. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess, you know, as much as I like to go into long dissertations about things and history, I want to just highlight sort of from for us and I think for the town for the so from a Penobscot perspective um, and for the town I think there are some really critical things uh, about um, the role that Chief Orono played in our history for the Penobscot Nation and I want to just give you a little bit of background on um, his lineage and sort of the, the time in history that he's so important for. And it's actually a story about America in its own way um, because he uh, shepherded, this would be my sort of baseline, like he shepherded um, the Penobscot nation from, you know, basically an English colonial situation into an, an American colonial situation, which was a really important transition. And maybe uh, I think for, for him, possibly part of a reset for Penobscot um, survival and presence uh, in the Penobscot River watershed. So he, he's very critical in terms of how we think about that transition time between the English colonial, as, as you know, during the Revolutionary War and then afterwards, his, his leadership was critical. Um, like a lot of historical figures, um, and I think you're doing the right thing by asking um, Penobscots who have tried to think about and understand Orono um, through both sort of official and, and sort of um, oral histories. Like, it's hard to get the truth of a lot of these things. Um, what I think is interesting about his narrative, and you see this about with other, um, the histories of other narratives of Penobscot leaders from the, you know, roughly the same period uh, and afterwards and into the, even into the 19th century, um, is how old he lived. So old John Neptune, which uh, Fanny Hardy Eckstorm um, uh, chronicles in her collection of, of stories about Penobscot um, people and places, um, also was said to have lived, you know, at least to a hundred or so as well. Um, I, I mean, I think that's just something about, uh, that can both be true. I'm not denying he, he <laughs> didn't live that way, but giving him authenticity, giving these leaders authenticity by making them older and stretching back into an old, as old as possible time period, also plays into an imaginary that I think is also um, part of colonial histories where the real natives are the old and forgotten and dead ones. And then the, the current ones are not so much um, authentic or real as, as, as much. So I think I, I, I worry about that, um, rendering of his age being so, so old um, is I think part of that. So I think 
the truth of that isn't uh, my concern. It's just I just want to sort of bring that bring that out. Um, the other part that that Orono really represents. So this transition to English into American colonial uh, spaces, and I believe James will talk about this um, uh, more later. Is his kinship. Um, so his his two, as far as we know, and I think this is correct. Um, his two grandfathers were very important, very important people. Um, on the one side, on his mother's side, um, his grandfather was um, a 17th century Penobscot leader named Madakawando, um, who was uh, really a critical uh, chief for the Penobscots um, during a lot of the period of French and Indian Wars and uh, early French and Indian Wars and sort of a lot of the initial contact with French and English in the 17th century. Um, and his father, so Madakawando is one of the one of the Penobscot leaders that also that makes pretty strong connections and, and allies out of the French to kind of mitigate English colonial um, interactions. So he uh, he meets the Baron of Saint C the Saint Castine, the third Baron of Saint Castine, uh, some somewhere down in the Lower Penobscot, um, and they become allies and friends. And um, Madakawando's daughter marries this person, the Baron of, of Castine. Um, it's that's an interesting cultural piece because um, for. Uh, Wabanaki people, this the out marriage is actually a preference. So this idea of marriage and political alliance is, is tied together in a lot of different parts of our history. And then also that um, while the the narrative of Orono being blonde and blue eyed, or I'm not I'm not convinced of all of those of those stories, but um, him being um, his tracing of his ancestry through his mother's uh, family is a really critical thing. Penobscots, especially at the time, were still very matrilineal in terms of thinking about who our identity is, is through our mother's lives. So the fact that he became um, not a French leader, <laughs> but a Penobscot leader, uh, and was really sp spent his life and his identity was tied to his mother's family, makes a lot of sense culturally whatever his sort of racial makeup or how he looked. So I think that's also a really important part to think about. Um, so the other kind of big pieces is um, going back to this 18th century uh, and into 19th century history. Um, as some of you know, the, you know, eventually things get really bad. Um, and James, I think, can talk to this as well. He actually did an art piece um, where the English issued a proclamation in 1755 for the scalps of Penobscots. That didn't come out of um, that didn't come out of just anywhere. That uh, came out of a long history of uh, of peace and negotiations with the English, but also um, um, intense uh, rivalry in the um, in the middle of the 18th century um, between Penobscots and the English. Uh, you have, starting in 1724, the raid on Nor Norwich Walk and basically the destruction of that. Uh, James put up the Fitz proclamation for the scalps. Thank you, James. Um, and this led to a whole series of hostilities, the raid on Norwich Walk in the 1740s, um, between the English and other Wabanaki peoples, especially in Western Maine and all the way from Western Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont. Um, and this really fell apart when the, the English demanded that the Penobscots supply warriors to fight against the other Wabanaki peoples in Western, Northern New England and the Penobscots refused. And it was this, this uh, upheaval and Madakawando was at the center of a lot of these um, activities and, and allying with the French and being against the English that Orno, his grandson, was able to kind of, and, and this di diplomacy is very important, this idea that how to create peace out of moments of tension and, um, and upheaval is one of the things that Penobscot diplomats are known for during this very tricky period of time. And for some of us who are students of it, 
probably what we think of as why we are still here as a Penobscot nation. Um, and we're not on the border with Canada, um, basically is because of the, the agency of our Penobscot diplomat. So Orno is one of these reasons. He made the most of the, the space between the English and now the Americans in fighting for and maintaining our place on the lower Penobscot as a tribal nation and, and all of that. So there's just this very tense moment that we see Orno as kind of shepherding us into a possible reset. There are a lot of things and a lot of negotiations that exist. Um, where on the one hand, um, Orono in the, in, the, in the 1770s, you know, pledges this great allegiance and gives this great big speech. And I've circulated some of them about, um, about freedom and resisting the English authority, uh, which he knew so well, um, and liberty and lands and uh, all of that. That speech is really moving, but also it doesn't mean now once the Americans take over and we're suddenly in the, um, um, the colon, you know, the, the, one of the original colonies, the, one of the first um, states of Massachusetts, it doesn't mean he's also very critical and you see all, he appears in all these treaty records of basically saying, no, you can't build a fort there. No, keep, keep away from us. No, let us maintain control over the whole Penobscot River. You know, so there's a series of things that he um, is very critical of uh, the new American, uh, which seems a lot like <laughs> the, the old English interest in our lands and territories. Uh, but he uses a lot of his sort of um, background in negotiating and being part of the American alliance as a way to maintain a kind of Penobscot order and control over um, the, the, the lower Penobscot. And, and ironically, of course, the, the incorporation of Orono in the, er, er, in the very beginning of the 19th century, uh, five years after the recorded death of Chief Orono, also marks a moment where you know, there are a lot, there are many, many more non-native settlers in the lower Penobscot area um, where the dominion and control that we uh, even exercise, even post treaties in a lot of areas, um, um, starts to really go in favor of American um, settlers in the region. So it has also this sort of irony that after he's dead, a lot of that sort of maintenance um, of keeping the area more of a Penobscot area. There, there are settlers there, but in terms of the prominence and sort of, you know, other other places get founded in similar period of time, Bangor, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think that's how I would tell the story. Why is that important? It's a really important story about what is it that is, um, um, makes this not just a Penobscot space, but also an American space. Um, his story, aligns with that story. And I think um, that's a powerful one for all of um, all the residents of Orono. Um, and I think a really important, it allows us also not to forget um, the, um, the tensions that defined this place, uh, uh, this landscape, which I think James will talk about in terms of its traditional role as being a very critical landscape for obviously the Penobscot nation, Penobscot people, um, before and after uh, Chief Orono. I think I'll end it there. I didn't want to talk any more than 10 minutes about history. The other part of what I wanted to, to say is, as many of you know, um, at the University of Maine, we're doing a lot to think about um, Marsh Island and the university space as Penobscot space through signage and other kinds of um, um, uh, memoranda of understanding and collaborations. And to me, that would also be a really important um, thing to think about um, as the town of Orono moves forward, how to, how to really inscribe Orono as a Penobscot Wabanaki space um, in this critical moment in time of the transition from an English to an American colonial context. I think there's a lot of creative things we could do with that. Um, so I just want to put that um, out there as something that for, for us at the university has only added to greater sense of history and understanding between native and non-native. Uh, so, and we're really still at the beginning of that work. So I just wanted to 
put that out there. I know we were talking more like, what makes Orono so interesting? Anyway, um, I also want to put that out there because I think if we do this, do the, the collaborations, right, there's a lot to be gained uh, uh, for everyone in, in, in thinking about it. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a great idea. James, do you want to follow up with it? Yeah, I have a, a presentation, but um, before that, uh, I'm James Eric Francis. Um, I did not go to Orono, although I did marry somebody who did. Um, and I went to Old Town, so if I have anything bad to say about Orono, it's not my fault. Um, you all can laugh, that's a joke. Um, but before I begin my presentation, um, I, in, in, uh, I may skip through some of it rather quickly just to um, breeze over what, what Darren touched on. I'm going to talk a little bit about Orono and his lineage, uh, but I'll go through that rather quickly. Uh, I'm really uh, focused on looking at sense of place and um, the Orono um, landscape in particular. So just bear with me at the beginning as I kind of set up um, you know, this kind of journey uh, to look at the landscape. Um, can I share my screen? Yes. Let's see. Let's see. Can everybody see that? Yes, thank you. Good, good. So I'm looking at Penobscot sense of place, um, Penobscot language and landscape. When are you going to come down? When are you going to land? I should have stayed on the farm. I should have listened to my old man. That may sound pretty familiar to some of you. It's a, it's a song by Elton John. And have you ever had one of those songs that brings you back in time to that certain place, that certain person? Well, for me, this song takes me back in time to when I was three or four years old. And my mother had packed us up, put us into a small moving van and drove north out of southern New England, heading back home. And as we crossed the bridge, Tobin Bridge in Boston, that song came on the radio and she turned it up. I can still see her mouth singing, you know, you know you can't hold me forever. Another lyric from that song. And this Elton John song is really special to me. You know, because as my, my mother was leaving my father, he had committed adultery and she packed my little, my brother up, older brother and my younger sister and myself. And she took us back home to Indian Island where she grew up. And so this, this song is really important to me because it, it's that moment in time. It's the first time that I ever went home. And so it's kind of a gift every time it comes on the radio and I'm transported back to that scene. Because without, without that, I, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today about what we're talking about. Indian Island's my home. I grew up there. I grew up in a basket maker's home. My grandmother was a, a Penobscot speaker. And um, that's my mom. My grandmother's in the car also. So for the first few years, um, we grew up in that household. So we grew up in Old Town, Maine. Old Town comes from the, the place name called, it's, it's from the word Odene, which means village in our language. Um, so Old Town was kind of an anglicized way of saying Odene. Um, but I just wanted to look at the ways we as um, Americans, Mainers, 
name place. You tend to name place after other places, like you see in these famous signs. Sometimes these other places are biblical, like Canaan and there's others. Sometimes um, we see these names um, as what I call the way life should be, or, you know, you know that old main adage, <laughs> main the way life should be. Uh, places like freedom and unity and union and liberty, those type of names. We also here in Maine name places after people. Usually they're old and wearing wigs, and but in this case, um, they're actually honoring um, Chief Joseph Orna. Well, this must be a real old presentation. <laughs> So our story begins in Fort Pentagoet near Castine, Maine, where a young French nobleman meets a chief named Madaka Wando and Madaka Wando's daughter, Bindianisk, later baptized as Molly Mathilde. His name was Jean Vincent Abade, and he was the third Baron of Saint Castin, a small town in southern France near Po. Nice small town, I've been there. So at that time, these two fell in love and um, had children. And one child in particular was Claire de saint Castin, And she had a son who in Canadian records was known as Berensis. Uh, Berensis would be, mean the, the little baron in our language. And that was Chief Joseph Orono. Now this image of Orono, he here uh, actually comes off the, um, an abstinence fountain in Philadelphia that was made for the World's Fair. It uh, depicted Moses in the middle of this fountain, and around this fountain were several uh, Revolutionary War heroes. So uh, Chief Joseph Orno had correspondence um, with General George Washington, and he gave a speech in Watertown, Massachusetts, where he said, our white brothers, the Americans, tell us that they came to our land to enjoy liberty and life, but their kin of England is coming to bind them in chains and to kill them. We must fight him. We shall stand on the same ground as our brothers, the Americans. So this is Watertown, Massachusetts in 1775. And this is a very important point in um, Penobscot history because, um, you know, this is the, the time when the Americans actually sided with us against the English, because we were already at war with the English. Oftentimes I hear people say we sided with the Americans against the English, but it's probably the other the way around. So when I, when I left high school, after high school, I joined the Air Force and I got stationed in Cheyenne, Wyoming. It's very alien landscape to me. And I, I missed home and I, I didn't miss my family. I, I didn't miss my friends. I missed the landscape. I missed the river. Uh, Cause this scene you couldn't, you can't find in Wyoming. There was no river in town. There was um, not a lot of trees that the uh, Calvary didn't, didn't put there. Um, so it was um, quite a different landscape. And every part of that landscape was higher than even Mount Katahdin because Cheyenne, Wyoming is about 6,400 feet above sea level. So it was vastly, vastly different. And so when I, when I, left, when I left the Air Force, uh, I, I started going to the University of Maine to study, study history and I was, I was taking a, um, a Native Studies class and we learned about the Trail of Tears. And as I was thinking about this walking across campus and the resiliency of the Cherokee people being removed from their homeland to some other place, some other place they had no idea about, um, it came to me that we as Penobscot people are still in our homeland. We have never been forcibly removed. And it changed the way I saw the world, how I saw the landscape, what I studied, and it's been uh, about three decades of, of looking at Penobscot Place. 
I read things like Thoreau. You know, I'm a part of the Thoreau Historical Society and considered a Thoreau scholar today because of my work, um, not necessarily on Thoreau, but on Thoreau's Penobscot Guides. He had two Penobscot Guides, one in 1853 um, and then another in 57, 1857. Um, 1853 was Joseph Atien, uh, upper left-hand corner, and then a man he considered the, one of the most influential men in his life in the bottom right is Joe Polis. Joseph Antion is probably one of the, the single most interesting historic figure to me in Penobscot history because he embodies a lot. He was uh, born on Christmas Day and we have a very rich Catholic background in our community. And he dies on the 4th of July, uh, a hero in Maine history. And we as Penobscot people are very, very patriotic. <clears throat> he actually dies on uh, Grand Pitch in the West Branch of the Penobscot on July 4th, um, trying to save some of the other lumbermen who were going over the falls with him. And he's considered our last hereditary chief, but also our first elected chief. His father was uh, a chief for life, and when he died, the tribe decided to go to an elected system, and he was elected anyways. And so he has the distinction of being both the last hereditary and the first elected. Uh, Joe Polis, uh, I find this interesting, just thinking about landscape. Um, this is from Thoreau. He asked, as we drew near Old Town, I asked Polis if he was not glad to get home again. This is after 16 days in the wilderness. But there's no relenting to his wildness, he said. It makes no difference to me where I am, what Polis says. Such is the Indian's pretense always. It makes no difference to me where I am. Polis was at home across Moosehead Lake on the west branch of the Penobscot into the Allagash, down the east branch of the Penobscot. It didn't matter to him where he was, he was always at home. That was an important distinction. One of the things that um, his guides gave to Thoreau was, was um, place names. And Thoreau wrote in his journals, he wrote that the Indians stood nearer to wild nature than we, the wildest and the noblest quadrupeds, even the largest freshwater fishes, some of the wildest and nobler birds, and even the fairest of flowers had actually receded as we advanced. And we have but the most distant knowledge of them. It was new light when my guides gave me Indian names, for which things I had only scientific ones before. In proportion, as I understand the language, I saw them from a new point of view. Fanny Hardy Eckstorm, who wrote Old John Neptune, um, as um, Darren mentioned earlier, but she also wrote a book called Indian Place Names of the Penobscot Valley and the Maine Coast. And in, at the end of her introduction, she writes, the day has passed when our Indian names were the butt of foolish laughter to be distorted, mutilated, displaced by trivial appellations. All Indian names had local pertinency. And recognizing the meanings and the correct forms of names, we enlarge our horizons and make home a more romantic place to live in. These old names are the colored curtains which hang beside the windows through which we look back into beginnings of humans living here. For ages upon ages, countless human beings have lived, toiled, and suffered here. And we have left only these names. Well, I don't agree with that last piece, but. One of the things that, when I started to study place names, when I started um, reading a lot on cultural geography and reading other people's, um, native people's indigenous landscapes, uh, I came across this Chinese geographer named Yifu Tuan, and he came up with this very simple formula. It said space plus culture equals place. So you can take a space, any sort of area, let's say the Penobscot River Valley, and today we define it from a main American Western cultural standpoint that, oh, it was a logging river and, you know, paper companies and pollution and now the river restoration and, you know, um, all of that. 
But if you change that cultural standpoint, it's a formula, you can, you can play with this. You, if you change that cultural standpoint and put in a Penobscot cultural standpoint, you'll get a different sense of place. And so uh, my work is really predicated on tweaking that little piece of culture here in the Penobscot uh, and adjacent uh, river watersheds. For instance, if you take this word here, which is uh, Katatin, which is, um, which means greatest mountain. And people often say to me, oh, well, well, that makes sense. And I ask them, well, why does that make sense? And they say, well, it's the biggest in Maine. So right there, as soon as they say the biggest in Maine, they have mixed apples with oranges because they're taking their cultural viewpoint and attributing it to a word that was created in another cultural viewpoint. And so the biggest, first of all, Maine doesn't exist when this word was invented. Um, and Mount Washington's right across the border in New Hampshire. That is in fact bigger. Um, but even someone back in the day wouldn't be able to tell one mountain bigger than the other. So why is Katahdin greatest? Um, it has nothing to do with its size. I think, you know, through our oral stories, there are a lot of different reasons why Katahdin has this majesty and this pull about it. I don't know exactly what those reasons are, but I know that I feel it and it has an energy w when I'm there. Um, but it certainly has little to do with its height, especially in a, um, a colonized uh, framework, such as a, the shape of the state of Maine. So when you look at Penobscot Place, you get a couple of things. You get a geologic or geographic description. Um, they're almost like a roadmap for, for travel. We were a mobile culture and uh, moved with the, the changing of the seasons. And so traveling up and down the river was a necessity. And so these geologic and geographic descriptions also uh, act a lot of the time as uh, roadmaps. Um, sometimes they're natural resource based. That's Birch Island, that's Hemlock Stream. Um, and some, sometimes even they're based on land use. You know, this is the place where we tanned hides or this is where we got our fish, um, things like that. And some, some of the, sometimes um, they're legend based and legends, uh, uh, an oral story kind of reinforces um, the presence in the landscape. Um, just a quick, this is up near Old Town, French Island, the Western shore was where we tanned hides. There's a little island here near Indian Island that we call Gut Island today. That's where we would gut the fish from the great fisheries that were here at the falls at Old Town. The Bernawepskik is what we call this place of the white rocks. And that's where the, this description of where the dam is today is where we get the term Penobscot from. Um, this Qualbuck from, from here back, this piece of river right adjacent to the Old Town Airport, um, was very interesting because I, I was decoding it and um, somebody told me that it, it was part of a dance and that this dance called Tutu was uh, the women and girls song dance and men would play the song and they would watch pine needles dance on a board and they would call out commands to try to get the women to imitate these pine needles and one of the commands was to turn turn around. And that turnaround word is within the name of this piece of just that little section of river. And so I wrote it down and then my uncle Neil said, oh, that makes sense. He used to cross that piece of river all the time. And I says, how does that make sense? He says, well, in, during the freshet, the stream flows from east to west, but normally it flows west to east. So the Stillwater branch of the river, which which goes beyond what we call Orono Island over here on the left of the screen, down into here. This goes back down to where the town of Orono is. Um, the water in the spring would go that way and normally would go down the main channel. So it was really about, um, you know, uh, a lot of field work and understanding the landscape. Now, Big Bog Island, is interesting because there could be two interpretations. Although there's a bog on this island, I don't think it has much to do with the bog that's on the island. I think it has more to do with Elton Bog 
which is up Birch Stream, very short ways, that from a river perspective, that big island being called Big Bog Island was a, was a, a signpost for the larger um, Big Bog, which was uh, fantastic hunting grounds uh, for our ancestors. So here we have Orono and Old Town. Just some, this is all written in the Penobscot language. This was probably second generation map that we did. Uh, the little dotted lines like from here um, is a portage. We used to go up the Kanduskeg into Great Brook and then into Pushaw, go up Pushaw and then come in above all the falls. Um, Ayers Island was called Ant, uh, Ant Island. Um, you know, there's a whole myriad of things. Um, Marsh Island was called Slippery Ledge Island. If anybody's ever been down on the river, um, the rocks are quite slippery. Um, let me continue here. Here we go. We're going to be looking at the Stillwater. What's interesting about the Stillwater, the Stillwater branch was named because of a, after a treaty uh, in 1818 and the subsequent treaty of 1820, there was a lot of controversy over who actually owned Marsh Island. And according to the treaty, it said all of the islands north of Old Town Island uh, would be the Penobscot Reservation. And so there was a lot of argument what that island was. Was Old Town Island Marsh Island or was it Indian Island? And so to kind of uh, quell that uh, argument, the state conveniently named the Stillwater branch, that back channel of the Penobscot River, its own river, the Stillwater River, thereby, um, you know, putting that argument to rest. So I just want to look at what's going on here in the river, because this is a very interesting piece of uh, the river and things that are going on here. Uh, you have the main stem of the river, which is there, and then we get the Stillwater Branch, which is labeled the Stillwater River here. And technically, from if you, um, the Stillwater Branch actually starts where the Pushar Stream comes into the Penobscot. Google Maps has it going all the way around Orson Island this way, and that is not um, part of um, technically the um, the Stillwater River. Uh, Google Maps has it wrong um, because Orson Island would then not be an island in the Penobscot River. The same reason why they took Marsh Island off the table in the same argument. Um, so Orono Island, which is this little here, also um, is part of our inventory. But this one down here is not, nor are these, uh, because they fall within past Pushaw Stream. So what is going on in the river here? Let's look at some place names uh, as we get close. And these are pretty much all in English. It's just the translation of what it is. So we have Ant Hill Island or just Ant Island, um, which is now called Ayers Island. And just down from there, um, we know that that area was called where the river forms a channel. And so you're not gonna point out that there's a channel, um, the river, that the river forms a channel unless it's something of importance. And when you're there, you can see Ayers Falls or the LY fishery below the outlet, as it was called in the language. You can not only see it, but you can hear it. And it's quite intimidating looking from the river perspective. So to take the channel was very important. Um, so you'd take that channel between Ayers Island and the mainland, and you'd make your way up to the top of the island and there was a portage there which took you up past Pat's Pizza, actually past the library, Pat's, Pat's Pizza and then on um, onto the river above another set of falls which was at the end of the Stillwater Branch. And this carrying place was, was really important and um, what's interesting is down here where the river forms a channel at the, at the lower end um, after they took out the VZ Dam, we found, actually my wife found, a petroglyph on a rock. It's a very simple glyph on, on a rock. And then a friend of ours at the north end of the carry found a similar petroglyph at the top. Oops, sorry. 
All right, so what's going on here now? The reason why that portage is so important is that by going the Stillwater branch, now the state of Maine called it the Stillwater River. They got the name Stillwater from our language. We called it Stillwater. We called it the Deadwater, which most place names are taken from an upriver perspective. And to see a Great Falls at the mouth of the Stillwater River really didn't make a lot of sense to me early on. Um, but it wasn't describing the character of the end of that piece of the river. It was describing the character of the whole length of it. And so the still water, it meant flat water, easy to paddle water, um, still water, opposed to if you try to go up the main branch and paddle up it, first you'd have to get up over where Basin Mills is today. And then you, shortly after that, you'd come up with what we call Marsh Island Rips, which is just about a um, horizon line in the river. It's very shallow, hard to pull up because of the slippery rocks. And then you get to where, where Great Works is, where Great Works Falls is, where the dam used to be. And the old name for that was Bad Falls at the site of a bad carry. And not to even to mention um, Shad Rips going around French Island, and then subsequently the falls at Old Town. There are just so many obstacles in the river that Stillwater River is called Stillwater because that is the way you need to go. You need to take that channel, that portage, and make your way up above the falls in Old Town with one portage at, at Jameson Falls, which is the, where the dam is near McDonald's on Stillwater Avenue. That's called Jameson Falls. And the old name for Jameson Falls was the, the place of an easy carry. You just have to pull it up over those rocks, and um, you were you were golden all the way up, probably until Gilman Falls. Um, but those were pretty easy to pull up, from what I understand. So, the town of Orono was where the town of Orono is right now um, is very important. In that, um, you know, I'm not going to point out where, you know, um, people lived uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, archaeological sites are pretty held uh, close to close to the um, community, but um, there was all kinds of activity here. Um, for instance, ant, ant hills are, are often used as caches because they were easy to dig in, and people could put items in there uh, to save for later. Um, but at places of portage, and also at places of fisheries, and you got two sets of fisheries right here um, in this image. Um, there have always been um, village locations. So there may have been several village locations, um, both because of the portage and because of the fisheries. This is just some place names from up north. Passanumkeag means above the gravel bar, and there's a big gravel bar in the river, which number five, which is called Okwajis, means a fish ladder, which makes sense uh, in that context because of, um, you know, gravel in the river is a perfect place to fish and a perfect place to put a weir to catch those fish. Um, uh, Bear Island, Porcupine Island. Number eight is... Um, Red Clay Quarry Island and Red Clay Quarry Stream. That harkens back to our ancestors, the red paint people. Now, the only one that's really confusing here is number nine, which is uh, Wabi Men Mentu uh, Menahan, which means White Devil Island. And um, out of all my research and all the time, I, I can't understand how my ancestors knew who Donald Trump was. Um, this... I know I've got political, sorry. Um, so I think, yeah, Blackman Stream was known as Alewives, plenty of Alewives Stream. So you can see how descriptive, um, descriptive these uh, place names can be. Passagasawakeg in Belfast, the place where we speared sturgeon by torchlight. Some of these are very overt. Um, but um, the process of um, looking at the town of Orono and understanding what is going on in the landscape took, um, took a while. It took us 
you know, kind of stepping back from the map and seeing really what's going on in a wider area than um, directly during field work on the ground. But I'm going to leave it at that and uh, open up for any questions for, well, all the questions can go to Darren, actually. And um, I'll just listen. Thank you both very much. That very enlightening. Um, did anyone have any particular questions? Um, we're so. Um, is there a way to kind of use this this sense of place to? Um, you know, I think what immediately comes to my mind is trying to incorporate. Um, tribal names into landmarks uh, in Orono, but is, I'm trying to kind of wrap my head around how we could use this sense of place also in um, identifying Orono. Um, and, and it's from what you have told us, it, it's to me it seems like Chief Orono was important, but what I've gotten from this today is that there's much more than Chief Orno that we need to be proud of in the town. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, not to diminish the importance of Chief Orno and what he did both for collectively American history, but also Penobscot history and other Wabanakis. Um, you know, Orno is, is a very interesting, uh, interesting place. Uh, in the landscape, as far as fisheries and as far as, you know, travel um, uh, you know, maybe through mapping and uh, kiosks or something, um, you know, honoring, um, you know, that, that sense of place, um, but also, you know, through land acknowledgments and I think it's important to have to acknowledgement that places don't, don't just say, you know, we're on the ancestral territory. We get a lot of time fashioning what um, land acknowledgements uh, should look like. It, I think it's called landacknowledgement.org or something. Um, and he found it quite quickly uh, just doing a Google search um, using NYU and land acknowledgements. Um, but um, it really asks uh, organizations to not just uh, flippantly do these uh, things to um, some, some um, museum science students. And we, they, from a parking garage and to me it was like that land acknowledgement meant absolutely nothing I'm trying to say something that's sacred and so that's when we start, really started looking at um, kind of putting together some educational materials around uh, uh, um, And you've heard of those land acknowledgements, right? You hear them a lot when you go to um, events and people just say we're in the, the ancient land of the you know, Cherokee Indians and, and that's about it. Um, needs to be more than that. Yeah. yeah, so I think just to answer the question too, from my perspective, and I put our, our sign here for the library. Um, uh, the, um, I think that's, I, I think, you know, Orono as a person is part of the story for sure, but um, naming a place after a person uh, from a Penobscot or Wabanaki perspective doesn't, doesn't, that's not, 
doesn't make sense. But I think that's sort of the opportunity here, you know, that um, we, uh, these places and, they, and, um, and actually one of the inspirations for our signage project on, camp, on campus was the, um, what they were doing at Bemidji State. Um, and they actually also have corresponding signage. I can forward some of this to you. I was just looking for it. I don't have a great set of signs, but they were also orchestrating the signage project with the town in, uh, in Bemidji. Um, so there's also this really important kind of linkage from the campus and the educational and sort of identifying places and connecting um, back and forth, um, you know, those critical places and we could, you know, the idea of the carrying place or there's a whole host of kind of landmarks that overlap and this is how we approach the campus is sort of like phase one is like where do our sense of places overlap um so we have we didn't put we didn't translate everything back and forth but we got a sense of place where we could overlap phase two which will happen this fall um will be places that are uh, more penobscot centric uh in terms of what we designate important places not just so there are new signs that aren't that won't be um already uh, you know places that are we want to put a sign on that the campus doesn't already have. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I think there's a real opportunity to think through a, um, a structure uh, of, of placemaking that um, creates mutual understanding and, and really identifies a unique set of characteristics for the town. Um, and makes it also very welcoming to Penobscot people. So um, I think there's a lot of ways to kind of approach this that could be really, um, really unique as well. How do you pronounce that? Oh, How the, 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 Awika, <laughs> the Awikagon, sorry, the, um, yeah, the little book house. Yeah, <laughs> Awikigani. Wigawam. Awikigami, Wigawam. Yes. So I have a question for you guys, and it's not um, not necessarily about sense of place, but in a way it kind of is, and it's about stewardship. And, um, you know, I'm really starting to take a look at um, how our environmental, Orno's environmental impact and, and making sure that we are also conscious of the river um, and, um, and how, I don't know if I necessarily have a question, but, um, I think it's important that we also, we also try to work with the Penobscot people as a, um, a council and make sure that we are, what's a good word, um, we're adhering to some, some really high standards and making sure that our, you know, that our municipality is also in compliance with some of those higher standards. Do you have any, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, uh, one is, um, you know, part of um, what's been going on here in Maine is um, some educational efforts by an um, organization called Wabanaki Reach. Um, you can Google them and they, they actually do workshops and they, they help to, um, they cater to people who want to be allies and to do it in a um, more respectful and uh, kind of um, culturally appropriate way. Um, you know, oftentimes just people come into the community wanting to help can be off-putting, can be patronizing or so um, they have really crafted and in fact the Truth and Reconciliation uh, project was a spinoff of the uh, Wabanaki Reach piece, but Maria Gerard runs that organization and she's um, does a really good job. And um, but she's uh, um, and so that uh, councils like yourself or just individuals who want to be allies uh, can find ways to do that. Uh, you know, without fear and, um, you know, because if people just show up on the reservation and say, well, um, it probably won't be very well received. Um, but there are ways um, to uh, approach tribes in 
meaningful ways. So that's where I would start. Yeah, I mean, the other, the other piece of this is you're already starting, um, you know, with this meeting. Um, and, uh, you know, I think our work, um, it, James mentioned, you know, the sort of sometimes these, like, say, in a land acknowledgement is very, um, uh, doesn't really do the work that I think people think it might do. Um, and I wasn't really, <laughs> we didn't author an official land acknowledgement for the university until these permanent kinds of signs started going up. So I think that, you know, it has to, and we signed an MOU uh, between the university and Penobscot Nation. Like, I think there are, these are pathways, right? In terms of you um, wanting to push on this work and, and crafting a history that accounts for the place and the people. Um, and, you know, things like uh, potentially a collaborative signage or, or whatever kinds of projects, these move the um, piece, the aspirations more together. Um, I'm reluctant to, you know, promise uh, either James's time or my time in terms of how that looks into the future. But I think there are there are opportunities, and I think you know, through grants and and other kinds of coordinated uh, joint efforts to make this a uh, very real sort of permanent types of uh, commitments by the town and with the Penobscot Nation and however we can help at the university. Like I think there's a real there's some real um, and and James. And I did, you know, a, a fair amount of work to make the MOU and, and the signage pieces all come together in a way that, you know, it was mutually beneficial and it was, you know, designed by, by Penobscot people. Great. Um, so, Darren, if we wanted to continue this, this, would we contact you or is there a liaison at the tribe that we should contact or? <laughs> I, I don't want to volunteer, James. <laughs> it's, um, I mean, I think um, some of that is like trying to develop what it is, um, you know, and I think we can have a, a conversation. Um, I think it always has to involve the tribe. It has to involve James. Um, um, but I think you know, he mentioned Wabanaki Reach. I think, you know, doing that as a way to uh, further train um, the, the impacts of colonial history on indigenous people for the council, those kinds of things educationally um, help set up, you know, how to do this work. And then, um, you know, I think James and I, maybe we can discuss uh, too how to engage you all or, or think about, you know, maybe there's a, an opportunity, say, for a grant or, or something that we can talk to you about that would, you know, give um, resources and energy behind something that we both mutually, I think generally, you know, starting small and having a real specific outcome is the best way to formulate the relationships in these situations. So um, I, th I, I take your your interest in all of this work as as a really great sign and 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 you know the the possibilities can go in, in lots of directions. A really great sign, no pun intended. <laughs> no, no pun intended. Um, well, good, Lori. Did you have something? Uh, I attended the a, a training by Wabanaki Reach. The trainer was uh, Barbara Cates, and it was in Bangor a few years ago, and it was really really moving and it 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 was an excellent experience and i and i they at that one was organized that the it was a synagogue that brought the, the training and then people paid what they could so that it was open to to everyone and not regardless of how much they could pay and i think that it's a great training for staff at our town and for the town council uh, and even if, if there are not enough people that want it, that end up being able to take it the day that it's offered, perhaps people from the public could join us too. But it was it was a really excellent learning experience. Great, thank you. Um, I th so I think for me, unless any other counselor has anything at this point, I think we should probably bring it back to council, kind of identify what it is that that council would like to do 
um, to further this project and then um, contact Wabanaki Reach and, and, and reach back out to, to the both of you uh, when we've gotten more of a concrete idea of what we want to do next. But, yeah, that sounds very reasonable. Okay. Yeah, no, and I think, you know, um, I think it, it's at the level of your goals. Um, and then sort of, I think we can help co-design how to get to the goals. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I'd hate for you to like plan a lot of stuff that doesn't sort of work with the way <laughs> we're, sure. we're, we're thinking about it. But I think that, you know, having a real co concrete sense of a timeline of goals and what you're seeking to accomplish, I think is, then we can really be creative and work together to, to meet them. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, if any other counselors have any last comments? Yeah, actually, I did, Cindy. I, I, I just wanted to thank James. Uh, James, I was so looking forward to this tonight. Um, I, when we first start, heard about this, I actually had gone to your website to kind of look at uh, uh, all about you. And, and I, I know that you had done a short film uh, collaborative with, with an individual. And so I kind of was there trying to find it and I found out it was invisible. And mm -hmm. I was trying to find, um, I wanted to watch it. And so I actually leaned on my fellow counselor, Meg, and Meg found it at the university. So they're actually sending it over us and we're gonna do a No, no, it's at, it. it's Orno Public Library. The yeah. town oh, library. Public library. All libraries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, James, I'm excited. You're, you're an amazing storyteller. Uh, I, and I think that's I, right when you first started tonight, I, I was just captivated. So I wanna thank you for taking your time also, as well as you, Darren, thank you. Oh, I, I appreciate that. You never know how it translates over the video. So I appreciate that because all I hear is myself and I, I don't see your faces. And um, I usually feed off the crowd. So um, I appreciate your kind words, Councillor Grenier. Well, this, this was, it really was fascinating. And there was a bit of a crowd too. I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the attendees list, which is kind of a new habit of mine from the other week. Um, but um, it's this is the most I've seen in a lot of members of the community too, uh, giving positive feedback, and it's leaving me uh, hungry for more. I want to um, I want to learn more about this. It's fascinating. I've been living here for 13, 14 years now, and uh, it's time to learn about where I live. So and this is fantastic. Thank you both so much. Well, what's really really unfortunate? I went to Orono, Minnesota, and they had a better grasp of the history there of um you know chief joseph orno than the original town orno did um which i was very surprised to see well let's see if we can fix that yeah and just in case the public wants to watch the um documentary terry and i will have a, a viewing party this week and then we'll return it immediately so you can check it out from the library as well <laughs> Um, there is a there is a guide that goes with it a, a booklet. Uh, it's a it's a movie that that needs a little unpacking. Um, so if you can find the guide, there's some some questions to ponder uh, after the film. And if you can find it, let me know. I will. I ha I have a PDF of it. So. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it all of your efforts and um, we will be in touch again, I am sure. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Now we'll get on to more not very much fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone, good to see you all. Thank you, Darren, very much. Thank you, Darren. Okay. I don't know, Cindy, this is pretty riveting stuff for me coming up. <laughs> I know it is. <laughs> Do you have PowerPoints in color for you? <laughs> no. <laughs> so um, thank you all uh, for being such good hosts on that. And um, I'm going to start the detailed discussion regarding the bond refunding and proposed new borrowing for infrastructure projects. I'm gonna ask um, Belle if she can bring Rob Yerksa and Jill Madigan up as um, as panelists. Um, but I will start by saying we've already had a brief discussion about 
the fact that the markets are such that we can refinance um, our existing municipal bonds um, and save between a half, a little over a half million dollars over the next um, 15 to 20 years. Um, so when we started looking at that and the rates and our current financial position, we um, identified, I think, a, a pretty good case for our, the council to consider borrowing um, some money for infrastructure. So just to put everybody kind of on the same page, currently we spend about 92 cents this year, we're going to spend about 92 cents of the tax rate, so 92 of the 2809 in um, for infrastructure projects. The plan that the council adopted, knowing when they adopted it that, they pro that we probably weren't going to be able to fund it, would see us go to about $2.98 on the mill rate next year and then stay up at an average of about $2.66 over the next four years. So um, pretty expensive to try to fund a plan that quite honestly doesn't um, more than meet the need. And I would argue in some places won't meet the need. Um, when we look at this, we see five years worth of work that I think Rob could go out and justify today, um, us doing today on the face of the earth. I don't think there are things on this plan that don't need to be done. And in fact, we've stretched and stretched trying to keep the tax rate low that we've gotten to a point where if we don't do something, um, these costs are gonna go up significantly because instead of um, smaller jobs, we're going to end up in full reconstruction. Some of these are full reconstruction. So um, I looked at two other, I asked Rob to look at two scenarios for me. One was going out and bonding for major infrastructure. And at first we were talking about simply taking two of the major upcoming projects off the five-year plan. Those projects were uh, the College Chapel infrastructure project and um, a drainage road project in what we affectionately call the Mahaney development. I understand not everybody calls it that. So it's the Frost, um, Frost Lane development up behind the school off Forest Ave. Um, those two would be about $800,000. And we thought that that would really free up place on the um, capital plan so that we could end up with a reasonably flat draw on taxes that would be sustainable. Going from, you know, the last few years we've brought in close to a million dollars and it's been paired back usually in the $600,000 range and this year down to 400,000. So um, at my charge to him was Let's see about taking those off and what does it do to the plan? And what we discovered is the plan still had too much on it. So um, the next charge was go back and try to keep it between six and eight hundred and fifty thousand, six hundred and eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year coming from taxes, and show me what would need to come off for the bond. I think he did an amazing job in a fairly short amount of time to show me that by bringing $1.9 million off the capital plan and funding it through a bond, we can keep up with the plan as it's written um, with a um, call on taxes of $800,000 a year. And that's a steady draw on taxes. It would allow us to um, fund the College Heights and Chapel Road reconstruction, the Mahaney Development reconstruction, Route 2 Culvert project, Margin Street drainage project, North Main Avenue um, 
the remaining funds that are required there, so 230,000, and um, half a million dollars for the main street sidewalk pedestrian and bike safety project. In doing that, bringing that off, um, it allows us to manage these full reconstruction projects, get them out of the way, and then be able to really look at maintenance capital projects, meaning the capital projects that need to be done on a regular basis to maintain the integrity of the road. And Rob can pipe in whenever he needs to. Um, so in looking at borrowing for infrastructure projects, Rob and I um, are in very clear alignment that should never borrow for a maintenance project. So we are not fans of going out and borrowing to pave. The projects that we are contemplating covering with the bond are um, full reconstruction projects. These are 25 year plus projects that we would borrow for 20 years to fund. When we do that, it looks like we drop our infrastructure um, draw on the tax rate down to a dollar and 79 cents and it slowly works up to a dollar and 83 cents um, with a 31 cent per thousand in new for new debt so that brings us to two dollars and ten cents two dollars and ten cents two dollars and twelve cents two dollars and fourteen cents so you're not getting wide swings in the tax rate it's very stable so what that looks like is a repayment that starts at $140,000 a year and goes down $2,000 every year after that. And that's based on $2 million at 2%. Um, right, the, um, our bond advisor just closed a note for 1.34%, um, which is one of the lowest numbers he's seen. So we feel quite comfortable running numbers at 2% that we're probably gonna come in under that. But just to, to give you that sense. So then in order to keep us at around that $800,000 draw, the next thing I asked him to do, which is in kind of the C, um, is take the existing need and stretch it out as far as you need to to keep us within that $800,000 range. And when he did that, he had to stretch to FY28 and Park Street, what, what that didn't fund was Park Street, Forest Ave, College Ave drainage, Winter Haven, Lexington, and Union and Margin Street. So there's still some need that he has identified as gaps in that much longer plan. So our suggestion on the infrastructure side is that council consider borrowing $2 million. When we look at, uh, we're still doing some um, work on the um, new borrowing to see where that will land us, but um, there will be approximately, $70,000, $80,000 that is gonna drop off. We'll have 30,000 drop off this year um, with the repayment of, I think that one's SCBA um, loan. And then we have another, the holder loan is done at the end of next year. So that's $60,000 that will drop off as well. So we'll, it, we won't see 140,000 a year long-term every year um, hit because we'll net some of the savings of the, the um, borrowings that we're going to retire. Um, the, I, I'm still working with um, Dick Rannigan to be able to give you the exact numbers on a by fund comparison of the new debt versus the old debt because up until now, they've looked at it as one number. I got some numbers back, but sent them some feedback that they need to run the numbers a little bit differently. Um, so the next time we come together, I'll be able to give you 
the specifics. I can tell you on the general fund, it won't be um, an astronomical amount of savings. Um, I would want you to make this decision based on what that new, whether or not we prioritize the new debt repayment based on what we know we're gonna retire. Um, so that is my presentation on this one. I've got two more to go. We've got WPCF and we've got um, a request from OTO Fiber. A quick, quick question. I see everyone flipping through their packets. I'm assuming there are packets sent home to everybody? Yes. I'm in my office. I work. I'm oh, that so. pesky work thing? Yeah, right. Go figure. And I, I don't have the luxury of a home office or anything. So um, uh, do we have an electronic? Um, Rob, can you share that with skuntz at orno.org? Does anybody else need the electronic? The shared screen was not going to work for this because Rob's got way too many numbers. So I apologize, Sam. Nope. That's absolutely fine. I was doing a quick search through the drive and I didn't see anything. So because um, there wasn't anything there. I found that out. Thanks. So, um, Sophie, I apologize when it comes to numbers. I'm a little slow. So you had said that we usually spend 92 cents. So that's what we're spending this year. Okay. But this year we really didn't fund much infrastructure. If you recall, we cut a lot out. So if we were to have this bond, how much would that, would that be on the taxes? So, what I'm getting at is trying to figure out if we're sa actually saving money. No, okay, never mind. This is not an exercise on saving money. This is an exercise in a, um, an unfunded, trying to get an unfunded infrastructure program back on track in a way that doesn't take a, a hit of a dollar and six cents on the mill rate. So instead of a dollar and six cents on the mill rate, you're going to have somewhere in the neighborhood oh, mouth in my head. Of a, I'm sorry. A two dollar and six cent hit on the mill rate is where we are today. With the bond, it would take it to a dollar and eighteen cents. So that is the the crux of our issue. And, and when we talk about town, what the town wants to spend money on in terms of our our um, tax rate, I think that. Um, our infrastructure needs to be one of our central and highest priorities. That's one of the primary reasons we are we are here is to maintain both in a capital way and a maintenance way our infrastructure. So this to me seemed like a reasonable way that we could make a long-term plan work by taking advantage of the incredibly low um, borrowing rates. So uh, one of sorry, our um, attendees asked a question that actually um, is helpful because I, I wanted to sort of talk something out loud, talk something through out loud to have more of an illustrative example. So, um, so Catherine asked, what about Broadway? And looking at um, the packet that we received, what we budgeted for um, this year would mean that it would be about two or three years before Broadway was addressed. And again, this is a projection, right? So with the bond, um, it would instead be about a year or two before Broadway was addressed. It moves it up in the schedule, right? Um, the new plan without the bond would push it all the way back to about five years from now. So I think that, um, I mean, in terms of an investment in infrastructure and being able to to keep up with things, this makes a lot of sense to me because it really does allow us to move a lot of projects a year or two ahead um, and and really start to take care of some things that could easily degrade if we let them go much longer. 
Thank you, Catherine, for that question. And I, my, my question was right along the same lines because the plan C just seems like it's just not doable. And I was going to ask Rob, like, how long, how long do you, you know, when you repair a road or when you go into your infrastructure and you, you know, you start making these improvements, how many years does that last before you've got to turn around and go back again? Is it about five years, four years? So it all depends on, of course, the level of scope that the project that you're starting with. I think um, Essex Street is probably a good example of that. We did that one when, in one of the first couple of years that I was here with the town. Um, and um, you can see I've got it in the plan, depending on which option we end up running with, due for preservation paving. Um, in the next few years. So it's generally a, a paving project with some medium to high level scope is gonna last 15 to 20 years. Um, a simple paving project where you just cover what's there um, is gonna be closer to 10 to 12. Um, you'll see cracks six or eight years in. Um, but I, you know, I think, uh, Megan stole my example there because that is a perfect one that if you do track where projects like like Broadway, which is certainly due for maintenance, um, fall in the plan, even the existing plan, um, without the bond, it pushes some of the work that we really need to do either because the existing condition is bad or um, projects that the town invested a lot of money in 10 to 15 years, even 20 years ago, are due for that preservation paving, that maintenance work. Um, if we don't do something to sort of free up some of those funds, whether it be spend more each year or do something like we're talking about now with a bond, we're not gonna have the funds to put the preservation paving on um, places like Essex Street, uh, the Sailor Development, those bigger investments that the town um, put into the infrastructure in, in the last decade or so are going to need maintenance. And if we're still trying to work through um, some of the projects that uh, really need to be done that are more than maintenance, um, it's going to be tough to prioritize those funds when we need them. Typically, I'm not a big fan of borrowing for something this huge, but given how everything is kind of fitting perfectly right now, with the with the incredibly low interest rate, this is, I think this is really savvy and makes a lot of sense. Because um, like, yeah, and I agree, Rob, otherwise it's going to be this, this can that keeps getting kicked further and further down the road. And so I think it's really savvy. Well done for putting this together. And I think it's important to note, I think Sophie pointed it out, um, but I wanted to highlight that the projects that we chose for this potential bond are projects that have a lifespan that either exceeds or is at least the term of the law of what the bond would be. So we're not um, taking a 20 year note out to pay for something that we know is only gonna last 10 or 12 years. All the projects that we're proposing uh, to fund with the bond funding would be 15 to 20 year projects easily and some of the, like the culvert and those types of projects are probably 50 year projects. So, um, you know, I think that's really for me, only the only time investment like this makes sense is that um, you gotta make sure that what you're investing in is gonna last longer than the term of the, term of the bond. Rob, even with the loan, the potential of, of doing this, um, that and the size of these projects, this is a huge workload. Um, is, this, is this reasonable? I mean, that's great, but boy, you're going to have a terrible year next year. We're going to listen to you complain all the time about how hard. Uh, it is. <laughs> uh, tell Sophie. I told Sophie I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Um, I asked that something. very same question. I was asked the same question, and um, you know, yes, we can handle that workload. I absolutely believe you, Rob. I do. <laughs> Good news is that a lot of that work, Sam, it, it's because they are such large projects, 
we will have um, engineering support. Our consultant engineer will be helping Rob with that work. This is the, probably the closest we're going to get to me using the terminology from the county, but uh, this is the probably the closest we're going to get to money at par that we'll ever see. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, 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 the only thing I would add to this was um, in my past life, when we've kind of dealt with something similar to this in, in town of Fort Fairfield was that when we kind of did a bond for kind of getting things caught up, it was primarily up there more the road issues. But they also put a plan in place that said um, every 10 years there would be an upkeep, a redo. Um, I don't know if that's feasible to kind of like say, okay, so we don't get falling behind again in the future. I think here it's more of um, trying of making a commitment um, that we're going to bring you $800,000 a year of work maintenance construction work and we're going to make it a priority to be funded moving forward so that um, what Rob is showing me is that this should kind of get us over the hump and then we should be able to maintain. Now that's saying that conditions on the ground continue to deteriorate at the same speed and things happen uh, that are beyond Rob's control and also costs of projects change. So for, as an example, both the College Heights and the Mahaney development re, um, work came in with original scopes over a million dollars. So Rob is not fixing everything. Rob is saying with the amount that he put in the budget, 425 to 500 apiece, those are, we would be able to get a lot of that work done. So th this is not perfection, but this is using the expertise that Rob has brought to the table for the last more than 10 years, um, which has served us, I think, quite well to not overspend, but try to keep on par if, as long as we can keep the preservation work coming in behind it. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally on board. I, like I said, we're close to money at par, so that's a good investment based on the rate, so I'm good with it. What does money at par mean? I'm from Aroostook County. Never so typically that. what it was with, with really quickly, when Canadians want, when, when Americans want Canadians to spend, instead of it being, I'm going to take 30 cents off of your dollar, they're going to give you Canadian dollars worth an American dollar. No. Okay. After you said Canadian, I knew exactly what you were talking about. <laughs> Does that give you enough, Sophie, to go on to the next? It does, but this is probably one of the only financial discussions we've ever had that our finance committee chair hasn't weighed in. I, I, I have plenty to say at our finance committee meeting when most, most of us were there. Uh, I, I just don't see how we can ever make the commitment to infrastructure that we need to make without doing something like this. Um, I'm thinking back to the comprehensive plan work and the discussions that were taking place during that project about infrastructure and how hard it was to keep up and how we were continuing to fall behind. And uh, I, I just think this is the time to, to make the leap and, didn't, and to do this work. And uh, I can just reiterate, Sophie, part of this bond would pay for the refiguration of Main Street with the sidewalks and yep. so that will be a big. plan is to be able to leverage that half a million dollars that he put in um, for for the sidewalk project to leverage some federal funds to so that we can actually do a lot more on that project, which would be great for us to to be able to do. Um, so I've gotten feedback on public works infrastructure. There are two other types of infrastructure that I want to address. The, the next is um, water pollution control or sewer infrastructure. Um, with Rob's plan, there is a project that is um, in our CSO master plan that marries with that. And that's, uh, believe it or not, the Mahaney development. But um, for Joe, 
the budget estimate from 2016 was 860,000 um, to be able to do that work. We are going back to the drawing board. Um, Joe and Rob are gonna work together on this uh, to see if there is any work that has been carried in one budget estimate that has been duplicated um, because the CSO plan was developed just for, that pricing was just for WPCF. Um, so there's that. And then the other um, project that is really important to support future development in town is the upsizing of the main on Hillside. Um, it is currently um, at its full capacity. And so if somebody wanted to uh, do any kind of uh, development um, on Park Street, we are now limited right now to um, the existing condition at, because of our sewer line. That is a, another $220,000 for that work. So um, Joe and I talked about um, borrowing a million dollars and we have already told you that we have decreased our um, consumption, which impacts the amount of um, money that we bring in to WPCF not even talking about the analysis for current year, just prior years from 2013, we've seen almost 14 and a half percent drop in consumption, which is great for those people not wasting water and having water, um, you know, uh, conservation. It does not work very well for, for Joe's uh, rate structure. So um, just the debt alone, figuring in another 2% drop in consumption on a regular basis outside of what's happening during the pandemic, we're looking at a million dollars of borrowing equating to about 25 cents on the rate structure to pay for that. So um, when Joe and I started evaluating this, um, we learned that the um, formula for main bond bank loan forgiveness, which you can only do for water and sewer projects, um, is, doesn't, isn't just about how high your rates are. Our rates right now continue to be among the low, lowest um, of our comparables. And um, so we had been under the impression that we were way too low to be able to um, qualify for loan forgiveness. I ran the numbers based on the um, templates that the bond bank and main DEP made available. We appear to be about a nine. You need to be a seven to qualify, meaning the higher you are, the, the um, more eligible you are. So um, talking with Dick Rannigan, our bond advisor, we don't think that borrowing money through floating a bond for Joe right now makes the most sense. We think we should um, look at borrowing money through the main bond bank and trying to get some principal forgiveness. Right now, the rate that the bond bank is um, posting um, in their calculator is 1.5%. So it's not like we're gonna lose a lot um, doing it that way. So I think that um, there will be some extra fees associated with that, but Dick and Lee Bragg, the attorney that is our bond counsel, um, promised that they could walk us through that. So for right now, Joe and I would like to come back to you with um, more specifics around bond bank and potential loan forgiveness. We may have to raise the rates a little bit as part of that package, but I think we would have to anyway to pay for any new debt. Is that making any sense? It, it does. Sophie, what is the uh, potential loan forgiveness percentage with the bond bank? So they say, oh, I've seen it 100% forgiven. That's very, very rare. Um, I think we would be lucky to get half a percent or maybe even a 1%, but that I think would be, uh, I think we should 
be happy if we got even 0.25 or 0.5. So Sophie, when we look at um, uh, back to the public works plan bonding $435,000 for Mahaney, that's completely, that has nothing to do with the sewer. That's just Rob's piece. Um, and it's, it's project, it's scheduled in the projective FY 21, 22. So would, would you be try, looking at trying to do this in coordination with that project? Yeah, you yep. want to do it in coordination because you save so much money. Um, and it, when we say FY 21, 22, um, the bond bank, we can apply for straight out loan anytime we want, but if we want loan forgiveness, there are, there are times during the year. My memory is telling me it's either going to be um, mid-September or October. Um, I have to go back and look some more um, at that, but we would want to line it up um, so that we were doing the work and actually trying to save as much as we can on mobilization, engineering, contract administration, all of those things. That's, that's going to be a huge project, but we also think that is a major contributor to our CSO problem. Right, Joe? <laughs> um, Sophie, I would be interested to see what kind of a bump you would be looking at at the rates uh, when you do this loan and what, how long you could keep that rate or would we be looking at several steps increase? Well, good point. Likely be looking at steps um, of increase. Um, and I think we're also going to need to look at the priority in the plan. I think I would combine this with a rollback of some of the infrastructure planning. Um, when we started that this year, when we took Bennick Road off the, the, cult, the um, main upsize on Bennick coming out of uh, Godfrey Drive, we took that off the plan and kind of held it as a placeholder. So I think Joe and I have a bunch of work to, to um, do for you because it's not just the loan. We also need to look at um, building in more for savings for future projects because right now we're using what we had saved before and we're going to, I don't want to pull that down too low or else we'll end up in a situation where an emergency won't be something that we'll simply be able to manage. We'll end up having to borrow with no control over when we want to borrow. And I think that's a mistake. That's, that's not a good place to be. So it sounded, and I'm watching people, it looked like you were good with Joe and I coming back and kind of putting that part on hold for right now. Okay. Yes. So the, the last piece is, um, you know, over the years, the town has invested quite a bit of effort, both personnel and in-kind and cash towards the fiber project. So we just finished paying about $115,000 as our match for the NBRC grant. Um, Belle, you wanna speak? No, okay. Um, our match to the MBRC grant, the fiber has been strung. Now we're looking at um, the need to have drops and actually be able to make connections where they can start to provide the service and have people pay, which will eventually become the model that makes OTO fiber self-sustaining. Um, and it's been the the vision all along, but just like our other infrastructure, we just have not had the money to adequately fund this. So um, when I looked at this and talked with um, my designee on OTO Fiber, Bell, who is also the president of the corporation, um, about what their needs are, what came about was um, if they had $250,000, they could really move this pilot project forward. And my thought was with these rates, so that they can't, if they borrow, it still comes back on our bonding because we are a sole municipal entity. 
So we own, we own their risk. Um, if we borrow on their behalf and um, have them pay us back, much like we did with OEDC, um, we will um, be able to kind of jumpstart that fiber access at relatively low rates for our community in some high, highly used areas and um, be, be able to get the money back. So ultimately it would be a, a wash for, for our community. So um, I ran the numbers not understanding fiber because my ABLE um, assistant manager was out of the office at that moment. Um, I ran the numbers on a 10 year note thinking that it was not as long lived as a road project and learned it's actually longer lived than a road project. So we would um, need to rerun the numbers, but at 10 years, it um, starts out in year one at um, about $1,700. That would be the payment for the first in FY21. And then after that, it goes up as far as 29,750. I would expect that to come down considerably. I think OTO would need us to structure a repayment that was slower on the front end and then paid us more than the annual bond payment on the back end to get to a net zero for full repayment. Um, and I think that this is, if we were borrowing, part of the agreement would be it would only go in Orono. We are not borrowing for Old Town infrastructure. That way, if anything happened with OTO, we would still have the infrastructure. So have I done a good job of explaining, Bell? Yeah, okay. Is there similar uh, movement on the OT side of the OTO? What's, what's going on here? What's the whole picture? So um, we just had a board meeting today. To be fair, um, this conversation kind of started on Thursday afternoon when I casually said to Sophie, well, would you be willing to borrow money for um, OTO fiber in order for us to get this pilot project move forward a little bit faster? And she said, well, we could certainly look at the numbers and present it to council on Monday. So um, this is a fast turnaround. I spoke with um, EJ Roach, who's the economic development um, director in Old Town um, this afternoon. He said that they have lightly considered it, but certainly movement on the Orono side um, probably would help encourage them to move also. And then the other thing that um, Old Town has that Orono does not as it's a forest products community. So there's uh, potentially some grant funding out there um, that will allow us to get some drops into um, Old Town. And the benefit of this, of course, is that um, the, the board considers debt, OTO fiber debt, not necessarily Orono debt versus Old Town debt. So if we are uh, indeed able to leverage grant funding for um, Old Town that uh, just decreases the overall um, expense, but increases the revenue that we can uh, bring back uh, and the number of customers we can bring online. Um, Belle, I have a question too. I have two actually. With the with the funding, how soon could you start this pilot project? Like, what what are you thinking? So it depends. It sounds like six to eight weeks. We would be going out um, to the to, for bonding. Um, probably about six months in order to get the infrastructure, because you still have to string, you know, physical cables from the poles to the homes and put. Um, equipment in there also, and we have to get a provider to do that. We're well on our way to identifying that provider and the uh, model that we're gonna use for the pilot, um, but it wouldn't be September or December. It's uh, likely to be six months out. Six months. My other question was, can you remind me again, like what the pilot area was? I know there was a mile or Yeah, something. so um, the pilot runs down Kelly Road um, to when we um, took advantage of the 
fiber that we ran out to Public Works Garage. I don't know if you remember when we um, built the Public Works Garage, we had to run a fiber out there to provide service to them. Um, so it takes advantage of that. It, uh, so it provides service to Kelly Road down to uh, Main Street, down Main Street to Bennick Road, and down Bennick Road to just a little bit past Noise before we um, ran out of funding for the um, backbone. The uh, $250,000 that Sophie is talking about will actually allow us to um, um, a little bit of flexibility. It will, we can put full drops in on the pilot project, but we could also string new fiber um, potentially through our downtown, um, which we weren't able to do before or um, into other neighborhoods that have denser, um, um, higher density so that we can get more people online. Um, so I, I know lots of you have experienced Zoom congestion and that's what we're trying to alleviate with fiber is that you don't have to worry about whether your neighbor is also on Zoom and all of your kids are also on it, um, which slows down the circuits if you have like a cable provider doing your um, internet. Thank you, Bill. So Sophie uh, or Bell, my, my question is, um, how are we projecting, um, I guess I'm gonna use the word customers because it's gonna be customers um, fees that are gonna pay off this bond supposedly. Yep, so we've done a lot of talking to existing ISPs. The, um, the question, there are a lot of municipal plants out there that have um, take rates of 70 to 85 percent and that's because they're the only game in town and we are not in that situation we have um, you know there's our existing providers in town so we are looking at um, 25 percent take rate at the end of the first year and hoping to uh, accelerate that to 40 percent by the end of the third year um, we've had ISPs who are competing against um, existing providers tell us that that is a reasonable um, take rate to estimate. And, and we have a sense of what the rate might be for people who decide to participate and how does the, the, uh, the percentage of people participating multiplied by the potential rate of the service equate with the payments that we're going to have to provide to pay off a loan? So we ran this out. Um, I had a couple different scenarios that um, Sophie and I looked at and um, depending on which neighborhood you choose, you can um, within three years, you are operating on a net positive basis. Um, within the first two years, you're, um, you have more expenses and your take rate's not quite as high yet. Um, but that's the, that's the reason for the, the ramp up period. When you say your expenses, you mean covering the, the debt? Covering the debt and yeah, covering the debt is the, um, the variable. And then of course there's some operating expenses when it comes to leasing the cold space and, um, paying somebody to keep the fibers on the poles. And for this sort of, um, would that, um, that would get in the way of future expansion of the system until that bond was gone. Is that true? Because it wasn't, I mean, was the rest of the expansion going to happen based on, you know, revenue generated? So um, it's no, the, the expansion is never, we've looked at it and the expansion has never worked without having upfront capital in some way. Um, we are, and in whether it's bonding or a private investment or something, um, the revenues come in healthy enough in order to pay off a bond, but not in large enough chunks in order to do capital projects until you get well down the, well down the road. It'd be like, um, building your house one wall at a time because that's how much your revenue how much your paycheck will support it 
um, that's why you get a mortgage, you borrow the money all up front, you put everything up and then you pay it back um, slowly. Um, so the, the revenues support the, the bond expense because it's the slow money. Um, we're also working with a couple different um, groups within Maine um, that, I don't want to say that it's not charitable lending, but it's um, economic development type um, groups that look at this as a way to uh, push forward the municipal plants. Um, to see what we can do about getting full build out money rather than going to the town to bond full build out money. I, I, I would find it helpful to uh, see some of the work that, that you obviously have done um, in, in paper form so we can, as we're looking at the uh, public works proposal, we can actually um, dig into it a little bit. So we're going to run this again with a 20 year loan. We'll also at that time have, there are four components to this borrowing. There's the non callable portion. Um, there's the new money. There's the callable portion. And um, then there's the, the, all, the whole question of OTO. So we're going to come back to that, Tom, with a package. I just want to, I, I want to make sure that you guys are in general willing to, to look at it. And if you are that, I think sounds great. We yeah. can formalize this for you. I, I guess the other question I have is, um, it's kind of a negative thing, but how does this project move forward without this kind of infrastructure loan? So if the council decided you know, we, we just can't handle any more debt, even if it's likely to be repaid by users. What happens to this project? So we continue the, um, the slow roll, I guess, is really the, um, the way it would work is we would continue looking for um, grants. We would continue talking to um, outside funders. Uh, we did uh, quite an extensive study with the Post Road Foundation. Um, and they have um, different financing models that involve outside um, parties having an ownership interest in the infrastructure, which is not necessarily ideal for municipalities, but um, it's certainly a piece of infrastructure that we are pretty sure that we need in our community. Um, yep. So that's also a way to move forward. There's there's ways to do it. It's just going to take a lot longer to do. Okay. Thank you. So based on our discussions, um, I think the next step is for me to get a package together, full package with Dick and Lee Bragg with a timeline and bring it back and for your, us to likely have a public hearing um, in September. Um, on the new borrowing at our meeting on the 14th. And you'll have between now and and a week before that public hearing to decide what that package is, full package will look like. So it gives us some more time. And we'll get, we'll get the information that Tom requested. Yeah, so normally when I do that, you would get Dick's raw data, our estimates, you would get where this is, uh, essentially being repaid with revenue, Bell's data that she has already provided mm -hmm. some to me, um, and then a timeline from the attorney along with my narrative on in 100 words or less or so, what this would do and how we would repay it and what it means. Great. We look forward to all of that wonderful reading materials. <clears throat> Thank you, Rob and Bell and Joe for giving us detail. So um, we will move on to the next item, 
which is an update on COVID-19 educational campaign, review of proposed resolution language and discussion of potential ordinance language. And I just want to say before she starts that Sophie has been working very, very hard on this. I almost think she might have spent her weekend on this, but <laughs> I know she was out at 5.30 this morning working on this. <laughs> so, it's kind of what you pay me to do, guys. Um, yes, Rob, I'm all set. Um, so I want to change the agenda item a little bit, if I may. And uh, when that was written, we weren't quite so far down the road. What I would suggest is that we talk about the emergency ordinance language and see if this is something that council wants to move forward with. Um, and I promised our council chair that I would make sure that I reiterated uh, what I have been saying to her, which is that um, this language is not a recommendation from staff. Staff is re responding to the concerns that the council has given to us. So if there are holes in this ordinance of things that you think need to be here that aren't addressed, that is simply because we didn't hear it or we didn't internalize that it was important to you. So this is not everything that can reasonably be addressed. However, there is a magic line that nobody knows exactly where it exists. And that is the line between public health and the council's ability to govern um, public health for public health, safety and welfare and people's individual personal and property rights. And so um, the, it is a line that keeps getting defined through court action and case law most of the time when I come to you with an ordinance, what is in the ordinance, there are items that have been vetted through case law and that the attorney and I are quite comfortable the town has an absolute defense for. This um, is the most restrictive, most regulatory um, place that the, that the attorney and I can envision. Now, having said that, if you start talking about face coverings and say something that we hadn't even considered, I will take that back to him and we can talk, I can talk about it with him, that it's not just the letter of the law, it's not like a magic formula, it's what is the defense, what is the council's rationale that might allow us to be more highly regulatory if you wish. We can always pull back, there is, there is no question about that. So my direction to the attorney was to give you around the issue of face coverings and um, trying to get a handle on the large shared and congregate housing facilities um, planning prevention aspects, the most highly restrictive that we could be. Um, and this is what he gave me. And you will notice there is a page and a half almost of whereas is. And that is because this is a special kind of ordinance. It's an emergency ordinance. It's short lived and you only have the power to circumvent public hearing and notice requirements um, because you're going to find that there is an emergency that needs to be addressed. So that said, do you want me to generally s summarize what this does? So first and foremost, you are declaring that there is an emergency that you need to respond to. You are um, saying that in all public places in Orono, people are required to wear face coverings. Um, that means any inside a, a building where the public is or even on um, the streets, sidewalks, and public rights of way. So at the Village Green, in Webster Park, on the trails, um, every, everywhere that is public, um, people would be required to wear face coverings. That um, if somebody is having face-to-face um, -face, um, interaction with a customer, that they must have a 
face covering that um, it is if people are outdoors but are interacting with the public at curbside pickup delivery or service calls they must wear a face covering if people are on public or commercial transportation so in cabs um, ubers um, the community connector the black bear express they would be required to wear face coverings and if they were in um, if they were at a gathering that was otherwise allow, allowable on public property, they would be required to wear a face gathering. So let me be very clear. This does not cover when Cindy has 25 of her best friends over in her backyard having a barbecue. We cannot enforce this ordinance there, okay? Because it's private property. So goes on to have exceptions to face coverings. Um, and they mirror probably ones that you would expect. People who have um, medical condition, we are bound by the same rules that um, Governor Mills order um, promulgated. Um, if you're traveling in your personal, and I would argue or assigned vehicle, if you are eating and drinking in a restaurant, if you're outdoors in an unenclosed area that is appurtenant to a retail establishment or food service establishment where at least six feet of social distance is being observed, you don't have to wear a face covering. If you have a religious belief that would prevent you from wearing a face covering, I want you to star that one because we're gonna come back to that in just a minute. Children under the age of six um, are not required. However, between the ages of two and six, the accompanying adults must use all reasonable efforts to have their children wear face coverings when they are in an enclosed area. Um, people working in a profession who don't have face-to-face -face interactions with the public. So in essence, if I'm sitting in my office all by myself with no member of the public here, I don't have to wear my mask. I get up and I decide I'm going to walk to the public safety building. I would need to don my mask, wear it, and then I can take it off if I'm in an office without a member of the public over there. Making sense? Um, when complying with the directions of law enforcement officers, so if somebody got pulled over for, for example, suspicion of operating under the influence, an officer can ask them to remove their mask so that they can appropriately uh, manage the test. Um, settings that it's not feasible to wear a face covering, you know, like if you're having your teeth worked on or you're gonna go swimming, you know, things that you just can't wear a mask for. Um, and police officers, firefighters, and first responders uh, when it's not practical or safe to engage in an emergency service. I wanna be very clear, we had, some, um, we had some issue last week with um, police officers not wearing masks on routine stop at, traffic stops. We have um, changed the internal policy at the police department um, so it's no longer discretionary. Police officers should be wearing their masks when they are either not in the building or they are uh, not in their personal vehicle uh, their assigned cruiser. Um, the only um, time that that would be different if there was some real reason why, um, kind of like the, you know, dental or idea, if there was something that came up that they absolutely couldn't have it on. Um, so that is the individual component. Then we're looking at these um, shared and congregate housing um, complexes. These are places where there's highly dense population of individuals living in, an, in a way where they're sharing a lot of um, space um, and there's a lot of common area. So what we're saying is within seven days of the effective date of this ordinance, all uh, residential housing complexes with 100 dwelling units or more um, would have to uh, provide to the chief and have approved a plan that 
um, essentially mirrors the CDC guidance related to shared and congregate housing. And we put those elements in here, but it's really around the prevent, preventing the spread of the virus, how they're gonna clean, how they're gonna educate their people, how they're gonna enforce their rules, what their rules are, um, how, um, what, how they have identified services that either need to be limited or temporarily discontinued, or how they might um, alternatively provide um, their services um, to um, maintain safety for their residency, residents. Um, how they are requiring six feet of social separation and the wearing of a mask in any shared space. Um, where, um, how they're gonna minimize traffic flow um, in um, the enclosed areas like hallways, elevators, stairwells, things like that. How are they gonna clean? What are they gonna do with pools, hot tubs, and other um, items like that? So um, CDC really calls out exercise areas, pools, saunas, and hot tubs. And we wanna know how they're gonna, if they have them, how are they gonna manage those? And um, what their plan is for addressing confirmed or suspected cases of COVID-19. So one of the things that folks need to keep in mind is that I think there are people who want the landlords to engage in plan like the university engages in plans. Those are two very different types of relationships. Legally, those are two very different types of relationships. And there is a limit as to what we can require a landlord to do for residents. Um, so the goal here is to get um, these plans in, to get them um, approved, and then to ensure that they're being enforced. And for that, we have um, suggested a fine of $1,000 per day for every day that that plan stays not submitted, um, and um, or $1,000 a day for lack of enforcement of the plan. Now, from my perspective, this is not about a moneymaker for the town. This is about putting enough of, we have been trying the carrot approach, and in some cases it is not working. So this is kind of the stick to say, come to the table, work with us, we will work with you, let's try to keep people safe, and if you don't, there will be one heck of a fine coming your way. Um, and then for the face coverings component, it would, we have it listed as $100 for the first offense, $200 for the second offense, and $500, $500 for the third and subsequent offenses. Um, the other piece to this is we would have the ability to go after the person but we also, if let's go back to um, Cindy's barbecue, let's just let's say she decided to have it on the Village Green instead. Um, it would not just be the people that are at the Village Green that would be in violation of this ordinance. It would be Cindy as the host who would be in violation of this ordinance. Now that being said, this should not be a money maker. So the idea of this penalty is to simply have it there for those people who absolutely refuse to be compliant. The plan is that staff, and we'll get to who that staff will be in just a minute, but that staff would be managing this in a very, very much a public education way, trying to gain compliance. And if we didn't get compliance, we would then move to enforcement. Um, speaking of enforcement, Logical people that would normally be on here for enforcement would be the police department and the fire department. Given the current directives to the police department of being kind and gentle and seen as community oriented, um, we very much want the police department to take a um, education role in this and not an enforcement role. So we would see um, the police department being primary educators and the fire department through life safety and the town manager's office being primary, primary enforcement um, 
of the ordinance. So the last piece is that this is an emergency ordinance, which means it is not a forever ordinance. And I had to pick a magic day for it to sunset. Roger and I came up with, um, we would, there are two ways that this ordinance would go away. One, council can repeal it or modify it um, through any subsequent ordinance or um, on its own. Um, you can extend it if you so choose but it would automatically, barring action from the council, it would automatically expire when the civil emergency orders issued by the governor of the state of Maine plus 30 days, so 30 days after her civil emergency order expires. This would automatically expire unless council intervened. So that's what I have. I'm ready for your questions. Out of curiosity, um, are other municipalities doing similar things? I could not find. Um, so we, I talked with um, Bernstein Schur and I talked with Farrell Rosenblatt Russell. I had conversation with Maine Municipal Association. What we see are people acting through um, emergency orders in council communities. Um, and there's some question about whether or not they're just kind of mimicking what they're seeing in communities that have emergency powers ordinances. So there is some question whether or not they're even legal in some cases. Um, this would be the first that we could find. Does not mean that some town out there has done it and not, it hasn't splashed, but we couldn't find one. Because it's different than what, for example, Bangor and Brewer and others are doing there. They've been, um, directed by the governor and they also have emergency powers. I think what's unusual for us is that we have a college community coming back. I hope that, um, I would hope that we didn't have to do any, we didn't have to have an emergency ordinance. I would hope that, you know, in the next week, they'll be moving in next week, that, um, you know, that, I mean, I think we started talking about this because um, because our population is going to is going to double, and we've got kids coming from all over the United States and other countries, and I would hope that they would that this would not have to go into effect. I'm wondering about Section Six. Um, does Section Six require an ordinance before the residential housing complexes um, have to put a plan together, or or is that something that we can ask them to do? without ordinance? So we have been asking them right. to be planning. Um, with this, I will tell you, I sent my staff on a, on a mission to once you guys are done, I'm sending my staff, they're prepared. Once I have your direction today where you wanna go, the message that we're going to deliver is this is likely the ordinance you're going to see. You should probably get working on your formalized plan that you should already have in place. Okay. Um, and then I just had one more and that was um, face shields. So yes. I think of face shields and face coverings as two different things. Should we have shields in, you know, those the plastic shields as, as a separate definition or, um, um, or maybe like where it says, um, where did I see that? Oh, where a face covering means a piece of cloth. Um, should we also should we also have something about a shield so that people people the, can wear? Yeah. So the answer to that is I can talk to Roger about that. I know that in our internal policy, those who come to us saying they can't wear a face covering are required to wear a face shield unless we are provided with a doctor's note. But I also right. know uh, face shields are not ideal necessarily. Um, Ron um, Davis also provided me with some feedback on the um, buffs, the ones that go around your neck that you pull up and there've been more and more um, literature out there saying that that actually disperses the um, particles makes the particles smaller and allows them to hang in the air longer. So I need to talk to Roger a little bit about that. I think what I want to tie this to is 
um, bringing in the CDC guidance more yeah. because the guidance can change faster than we can change an ordinance. So, and I think that's where we want to kind of stay and be on safe ground if we can. If we're following CDC and we end up getting dragged into court, council is clearly um, acting in good faith, which is kind of the important piece. Right. Thank you, Sophie. You're welcome. I think the um, the piece about the residential housing complexes is, is such a huge uh, one for a lot of year-round residents here just because it seems like you know a place to incubate and spread the virus so um, the the fact that we have this in place is in, in, in this potential um, ordinance is great I also want to point out that um, this planning tool that uh, I assume chief developed, right, um, to go to the housing complexes um, that uh, I love the way that it asks these leading questions, like what steps are being taken to encourage physical distancing? Like what signage do you have and what does it say um, for the complexes to, to answer those questions? Um, we gave them an option to do this on their own. They seem to want to take the approach that they were like any other landlord and tenant situation, but this is clearly not the same thing as somebody who owns a two bedroom apartment for college students to live in. So um, I'm, I'm really, um, I'm really pleased with this piece. Um, and the other piece of mask wearing, I'm, I'm also really, I mean, I guess, look, I want to make it out of this pandemic alive. I feel like everybody does. And I tend to think for myself, well, let's have the strictest ordinance possible and no questions. Um, when, and so that's how I would feel about it personally. When I read the language, the only thing that I, I guess I worry about are some of these areas that are very gray in terms of what exactly is someone doing. Like for example, you must be wearing them when you're on sidewalks in Orno, but you don't have to be wearing them if you're exercising. So are we going to see people kind of arguing with each other on the streets you know, are you exercising or are you just on the sidewalk? Should you be wearing your mask? Should you be, you know, I don't have to wear a mask. I'm exercising by walking. So I'm, I'm wondering if it's going to create tumult, right? Um, in, you know, these, these definitions of who's doing what. The other thing that, I'm, that I worry about as well is when we mention like the trail system, for example. Um, I was hiking yesterday in um, Acadia and uh, we had our, our masks with us when we were hiking alone we weren't wearing them and then when someone we could hear someone coming up the trail we put the mask on they would put the mask on and it would be fine i can see some of our very spirited community members going on both sides of the fence there i mean we've had a lot of fights on the trail about dog leashes and things i, I could see that there could be some drama around those things so Part of me is wondering, now again, I wanna say that I personally would have the strictest ordinance possible, but when I think about how it actually might play on the ground in real life, I wonder if things like, you know, do we cast a net around the most congested part of town, like downtown and say, yeah, when you're in downtown, you need to be wearing a face covering at all times, whether you're exercising or not on the sidewalk. Um, but maybe if you are outside of that denser area, you have to maintain six feet of distance or put your mask on. I don't know if that makes it more complicated to enforce and we should just say, hey, heck with it, make it the strictest possible or, but I'm just putting it out there. So what you're saying are essentially mask zones. Mask zones. I, I, I think uh, Megan's comment deserves some real thought. Um, I'm looking at section four see while interacting with people in outdoor spaces, including but not limited to curbside pickup, delivery and service calls. I, I, I'm, I'm just wondering if it, if you're interacting at a safe distance outside, is that a different call than being in a downtown store? Yeah, I have to I have to agree with with Megan and, and Tom. I I struggle a little with the outdoor spaces, especially after you know a, a certain area of, of Orono. Like if you're out in western Orono, do you really have to be wearing a mask when you're walking? I mean it's 
seems like there's a lot of social distance abilities out there. But when you're downtown um, and you can walk into people on the sidewalk, maybe it's it's more of a more of an issue. Um, and I also had a question: if there is a commercial establishment, and I don't know of any off the top of my head, but if there was a commercial establishment that did not want to enforce the mask wearing, can they just not enforce it? Or so they would be penalized like my, I would be at my barbecue. So I think the way you look at it, that what you're saying is, so let me back up. I've already said this to you, Cindy. This is not my, this is not my desire. So you're not going to hurt my feeling if you just throw it all away or, or make it different. But um, the way you're writing it right now, it would be to say, if you're in an enclosed space that other people from the public are using, not going to your friends for a barbecue, but an indoor, um, you're going to a, a restaurant, you're going into a store, you are required. And by the way, we're holding the business owner responsible for enforcing that. I think that the the wear I hate this light the wear that um, that you wear these masks or or face shields should be determined by the CDC guidelines and I understand that they're constantly you know they're constantly shifting and changing um, but definitely on the you know the inside I'm not sure if CDC says that you have to wear a mask at the moment because I haven't checked it but at the moment that you have to wear a mask on a path or a, you know, if you're outside or any of those things. So I, I think if we just stick to those guidelines, I think we'd be okay uh, outside. I'm saying outside, but inside, you know, there, those are guidelines as well. So um, our, our esteemed fire chief is getting a panelist invite to join us um, to help with this a little bit, but um, the CDC guidance right now outdoors is six feet of separation. If you can be more than six feet apart, you are, you are okay. Um, what I am responding to is conversation at the council level saying that the problem with that guidance is that, and here is Chief, Bell's gonna um, bring him up to a panelist. Um, the, the problem with that guidance is that it takes discretion. And so um, at the end of the day, I would much rather, if I'm gonna have to enforce something, Cheryl, that what, what council wants me to enforce, whatever that is, I go back to the police department where people had different internal measuring <laughs> sticks um, as to when and where it was appropriate. And ultimately we had to cast a blanket policy. So I think, you know, it's council's choice. What I'm trying very hard to provide you with is an opportunity to give me the guidance and the way that you have to give me guidance in this matter is through ordinance um, because it's an exercise of municipal power that I don't have. Um, and what I don't want to have happen is for us to decide we really don't care if people are on the sidewalk without um, masks on and you get groups of people walking without masks on and maybe they're all part of the same um, fraternity so they're all in the same they're cohabitating anyway or maybe they're part of um, they're in the same apartment um, we don't know that, but people see them walking around and suddenly the police are being called to, to enforce something that they have absolutely no general direction other than you've got to be six feet apart. And then were they, were they not? Who knows? That's why I sort of like that. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, I think just to clarify, it was more about like walking on the river trail than downtown Orono. Um, but I don't know how to separate 
that too, the language that separates that too. Um, yeah, I mean, that's why I was sort of thinking about, you know, can we cast a net around high traffic congested areas, uh, foot traffic areas, because I think about the ways, you know, I, I live pretty close to town, I walk to work every day, pretty much. And if I'm walking up Bennett Road, and someone's walking towards me on the sidewalk, one of us steps out into the street, and it's not even a big deal. But I know that that's because we're on summertime in Orno. And so once there's a congestion aspect when when we double in population those choices get to be a little more fraught i think when we're walking around and, and so i would i i would definitely definitely support um wearing masks at all times in um high traffic foot uh, foot traffic areas congested areas in town up and down college ave park street downtown orno those those sorts of places um i would personally again I'd say mask the whole town, that's fine with me. Um, but if we're talking about what may actually be manageable for the largest group of our residents, then maybe that's something to look at. So um, when you say the most heavily trafficked and congested, number one, is that getting some traction on council or am I? I was just going to say Sam was trying to say something. <laughs> I know. Well, Sam's trying to figure out what he wants to say. Um, I'm really torn on a lot of this. I mean, I think I I I, I like where we're going with the heavily heavily trafficked area. Um, I think, yeah, like absolutely, Cindy, what you said with Western Maine, uh, that would be, yeah, I think really a hard to, yeah, I, I I don't know if we'd be able to do that if we want to even do that. Um, but at the same time, you know, something sort of going back to leveraging this with the institutions, uh, the complexes that aren't really listening to us. I mean, can we just say, hey, here, do it, or this is the ordinance and this is the fee structure that you are forcing us to do, to, you know, since you're not complying. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, my, I, I, I'm going to try to unpack that one, Sam. Um, but I think when you talk about the complexes, it's going to take 10 days to get this in place. If they all give us um, their plans, when this goes into effect, the only thing they have to do is follow their plans. Without this ordinance in effect, they can give us a plan and then not follow it, and there's nothing I can do. So, um, and if that's okay with council, that, that's fine with me, but th that's the, the piece here is that there, there is no, there's nothing to fall back on um, to, main, to ensure their future compliance. So Kyle just did a whole bunch of work around the walkable zone of town, right? where there's a lot of traffic. I would consider that if we extended that up to the furthest housing development on College Ave and otherwise stayed within that mile radius of downtown, does that kind of work for you in terms of densely dense areas? That would work for me personally. I initially I say yes. Um, <laughs> I want to think about it a little bit. I, I Sophie, I want to thank you for for saying that the enforcement wouldn't be with the police, but it would be with fire. I think that was a really bright idea because you're right. As soon as we, um, as soon as as this whatever we do goes into enforce, it goes into effect. There will be people who are not compliant, and uh, I'd rather not. We are. We want the the be in a role where they're being education, helping with education, and not being seen as aggressors on this issue, or enforcers on this issue. So I think that was great. And uh, I, I walk a lot in town, and I 
have no problem myself with wearing masks and I think it's good for everyone's health, for public health. And I see if you make this an, a mile radius that we're not gonna get compliance. And that means the police, if the fire is really gonna try to encourage people, they're gonna be out a lot interacting with people, encouraging them. And maybe that's part of the, they have the time to do that. But um, I have ex lots of experiences where I'm the only person wearing a mask when I'm walking a mile, within a mile of town. Just to put that out there, um, again, yes, well, yesterday, I know I brought up Bar Harbor last time and I was there again yesterday, but they have signage as you're entering the um, mask zone. So people are aware that it's time to put their mask on. And I, I think when Megan mentioned at the last meeting that the, some of the signs are humorous, I think that that humor helps. And, and, uh, and we have done a great job and Megan organized the, the business owners to put the pride things up. I think that uh, we have funny people in the town. Maybe that's another thing we can do is try to organize people to be funny about this and post things uh, that are humorous, but also remind people that this is the way we're going and we're doing it for the better of all. So I just wanna be really clear to everybody that um, neither the police department nor the fire department nor the town manager's office have extra time to devote to ensuring that people um, are wearing their mask. So when we do this, we do this at a cost for other things. And I ha honestly have no idea what that is gonna be. I think from my perspective, rolling this out, once we roll it out, um, that is where the bulk of the work is going to be. So from a staff perspective, whether it's the entire town or a zone within the town, um, it doesn't, the, the, the amount of work is going to be the same in terms of what we can devote to it. I don't have time to get super creative. I, I just, we just don't have that. So maybe that's something that um, the business community could help with and um, roll some stuff out for. My, my idea is to try to get information out and quite honestly what's going out this week is going to be temporary in nature. Um, so they will be laminated signs simply because the signage once we have an ordinance may change a little bit and I do not want to spend tons of money to make signs that I then have to change. And we might end up deciding that what we need are a series of cheaper, um, less permanent signs that get rolled out. Our gateway signs are going to, the ones that are currently up will be covered. And the ones that um, came down because they were in such disrepair, um, new uh, covered plywood is gonna go up with signage. We're still working on what that says, but a banner style sign on plywood likely will be the case that um, educates people about what we need in Orono. So I want to give a shout out. I don't know if Lori Sudelko is still listening, but the University of Maine, Lori, Dr. Dana, have just been doing a fabulous job trying to help us with um, our messaging and uh, giving us tools. So we really appreciate that. And, and timing, um, Sophie, timing, um, if, this, if this does become an ordinance, we need a public hearing, correct, first? In September. September. Yeah. September. We no. don't need a public hearing. So what happens is if you want to move forward with this, I am going to give Nancy a public hearing notice that announces a um, council public hearing seven days after it is published in the paper. So you have to kind of back into it. You got to call the BDN and say, what day are you going to publish this? Our hope is it would be um, Wednesday or Thursday. Then we count seven days out from that. And that's the day that we'll, we can hold our meeting and the ordinance will become effective after that. So the requirement is for notice and posting. Roger and I think that we should also hold the public hearing. Um, and I, I think what I was where I was going with this was that by September we should have a really good handle on what's happening in town because it really is going to start 
we really are gonna start seeing, if we're gonna see something, it's gonna be within the next two weeks, right? Non-compliance, and if we're, if we're really gonna start seeing something, it's gonna be soon, sooner than, than later. So I'm, I think that if we can get people to just be, in compli be, be compliant and to understand that this is a public health emergency, I know how hard it is. I have a college student who lives here with me. Um, it's like, then we wouldn't have to do this, but I feel like we have to do it if, if, it, if things are just looking like, you know, they're, they're going to be out of control. And there's also a good possibility that the university will shut down if, and send everybody, you know, home. If it's not, you know, if they're not, um, I mean, if there's too much virus on campus, I think is what I'm trying to say. And that's worst case scenario. I think that's worst case scenario. They won't necessarily leave the avenue or the grove or other complexes. So, I mean, you, you may can do their thing. That's great. I'm sure they'll do the right thing when they need to, but there's no way they're going to be able to enforce it with these privately held leases. And that's, that's, that's my biggest concern right there. I wanted to give Terry a chance to just get in because he's been waiting patiently. This is like the third week I've had to wait. Um, here's, here's my perspective on this, is I think that everything was great in Orno pre-students coming in. And then all of a sudden everybody went into a frenzy. No one was worried about walking downtown if a resident on Bennick or whatever street you chose that they were walking with no mask. Now we're kind of going into this like scenario of these are going to be these kids that are going to be doing something horrible. And I actually spoke with a couple of kids saying like, I don't get it. They feel like they're targeted. Like it would be like they, one, one kid actually said, I feel like I'm like the black kid. You're making an assumption that I'm going to go and do something horrible that's gonna disrupt our community and bring harm to it. So I just want everybody to be aware that we, we, we can't go aggressively into this thing with an assumption that these kids are coming in here with an intent to bring a, a virus to us. Is that possibility there? Yes, it's the same possibility with the residents who go down to Old Orchard Beach for the weekend or go to Portland for the weekend, not thinking anything's gonna happen. So I just want everybody to be kind of like aware of that. Um, the other things I was thinking about was that, Sophie, when you, when you have this thing written, um, CDC has, has noted that bandanas are not the best thing. That should probably be removed. Um, single layer gaiters, are, once again, are not. They should be like two to three triple layered. Um, and the mask now, um, I'm not really off the top of my head sure of the, of the company that's based in Portland that really was the innovator of the masks. Um, they were actually making them now at the bottom of the neck to go up because they realized the reflection up um, is better um, to prevent, especially as um, people who are serving individuals, it doesn't hit down below. Um, but I, I'm sorry, I was just kind of like, um, <laughs> I, I don't want people to get wrapped up in um, the assumption and lumping everybody together as a specific group of individuals who are gonna bring harm to us. And I want my fellow counselors to be aware that, yes, this is a lot of people coming in, I, I, I get it. And, and um, but I think that there's a, I, I've got community people who've just, who live close by here that are, they're like, they're aware, they're wearing their masks, they walk by my house. And, 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 and I, yes, I wanna make sure we're good, making sure we're taking care of the situation, but, I don't want it to be typically about these kids are going to be wreaking havoc on us. So that's what I had to say. Thank you. And that speaks to my point, Terry, too, is that we don't, if we don't have to have an ordinance, right, but we've got it in place if we have to, right? I think the only thing for me, Cheryl, is the timing. I think, I think we have to either commit to the publishing the public hearing and then we can always vote it up or down or we can even repeal it at any given time but if if we delay the public hearing then you're looking at you know trying to resurrect it sophie can correct me if i'm wrong but i need about a seven to ten day window 
to get to get a public hearing. So if we decide set Labor Day that really we need an ordinance, we won't have one till the middle of September. And I'm okay with this. I think I think it's fine that we do this. I, I agree with it. I just want us as we go forward beyond this that it's not specifically about like taking a specific group of individuals saying you fall in this group. And that's I just want to make that clear. We 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 do this with gay people. We do this with other minorities. I don't want this group to be persecuted, but I, I'm okay with moving forward with what we've already proposed. With without yeah, it, the bandana. It's, it's um it's a good point, Terry. I mean, there's always been a lot of like town versus gown drama in Orono, no matter what's going on. Um it it's also important for folks to remember that the university being open, it's not just the increase in 18 to 22 year olds. The university is a huge draw, which is Part of what drives our economy it's these kids parents it's you know um, people who are coming for different purposes to the university because it's open so it drives traffic in a, in a variety of ways not just the student population um, in terms of the timing of it i want to just i mean i want to move it forward um, in a fast timeline i i understand what you're saying cheryl i guess i just my concern is um i think that for public health i feel more comfortable enacting it as soon as possible knowing that we can repeal it versus waiting to see what happens and then suddenly the you know what's the expression i'm a city girl at heart uh the cows out of the barn is that <laughs> does that translate um you know once once several weeks have gone by and maybe there has been a lot of community transmission it might be too late for a mask ordinance to make a big difference no i i, I understand that i do no, no. I'm, in, I'm in agreement and I, you know, I absolutely, you know, understand your point, Terry, as well. I'm not like demonizing students at all. I, I work with them; they're phenomenal. But it takes a very small percentage, you know. I mean, like 95, 96 percent are fantastic. But then you have, you know, you know, four or five, six percent that maybe don't necessarily do it or make a couple bad choices on certain weekends. And you know, and to sort of like take Megan's expression a different direction, once that toothpaste is out of the tube, good luck getting it back, you know. So. Um, I think, you know, I mean, we just gotta, we gotta pay attention to the facts so that this is, this could be huge. And like Tom made reference the, the other week about, um, you know, predictions of university towns, college towns, this isn't panicking, but they have every potential for being the next epicenter of these things. And that's specific uh, reason why I was saying, like, I think Millinocca right now is dealing with, it wasn't a, 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 a issue about a college thing. It was a wedding that went on that uh, potentially has now gone and infested like I don't know a hundred people that in that community based on somebody who had a test that didn't get it read before they went to a wedding and they had it and hugged and was hanging out so I, I just my point is, is I just don't want to specifically say college kids by them coming in town are going to create something we all have a responsibility by doing our deed and it can come from anywhere. So yeah, I mean, I hear you, but it can be anybody. And I just don't want to like target that group of people. So I, um, I did ask um, Belle to just let Lori up, Cindy. Um, what I'm hoping Lori Sedelko will be able to share if she's there still um, is how the town how this ordinance will either help or hinder what the university is trying to do. Lori, are you still there? Well then. Oh, yeah. There you go. You can speak. I'm here. So, so the, the question is, you've had a chance to look at the ordinance? Mm-hmm, I have. And does it help or hinder what you guys are trying to do on campus? Um, I think it supports what we're doing. I mean, I think that we have had to make a, a blanket policy on campus that you have to wear masks, whether you're on outside or inside. Um, we did that because, <clears throat> I mean, we're, we're, everybody wants to come to campus and everybody wants to stay in campus. And that's, that's what we want. We want our students there. That's why we do the work we do. Um, but we can't stay unless we protect each other. And so 
that's what the plan is. The plan is for us to protect one another and to do that by social distancing and wearing masks and being as protected as possible. Um, we've got a lot of plans and testing that we've been working really, really hard on. We've got a postcard that's coming out that's going to be going to the students and the community members just saying here are some things that we recommend. Um, and these are some things that we're doing. Um, so we're trying really, really hard to plan for the worst and hope for the best. Um, and I think that having an ordinance of this kind in the town is going to, I mean, we can always scale back. Um, it's hard to scale forward. <laughs> um, so I, I'm of the position where I'd really love to see us have something, protect ourselves, settle in, know what our numbers look like, um, know that we're feeling safe and that maybe the Orno of the summer and the Orno of the fall can look the same and then go from there. Thank you. <laughs> um, so thank you, Lori, very much. I, I kind of view this to just go to Terry's comment as the same as what was done for um, the coastal communities. Um, you know, we just, we just want to be kind of not pre, I don't think preemptive is the right word, but we want to take, take steps before we're in a position where we we're backtracking. Um, so I guess my question is to council at this point, are we ready to move it to a public hearing? And um, kind of seeing by nods, I think we are. And the, the other question I have is, do you want it to go to public hearing covering all of Orono, or do you want to try and develop some sort of zone? Zone. <laughs> I would say what, what, what area it applies to. Yeah, I'm all of Orono. Um, so, Sophie, can we present it at public hearing as all of Orono? And then if we decide to do a, more of a zone, we could, we can adjust it or would you? Yeah. Um, open for suggestion. is telling me that that would be a substantive change substantive change um so, so i would let me talk with roger um i'm wondering if we can essentially offer option a and option b so we yeah. give the community notice that it could be either either one but i think there's a difference between saying the whole town in a smaller subset of the town and, and Sophie, um, IGA in that area over there is also Orono, which, which has a, a tendency to get um, congested as well. So that's another, uh, that's, that would have to be another zone, I guess. Sophie, my, my, my thing is that we're talking about downtown walking. So I feel like the people who live in the downtown area is more appropriate for this conversation. Two elements. I, well, I, I agree with what Terry just said, but I think the the idea of bringing two options uh, to a public hearing is an excellent one. I, I think too that there are two elements within the mask wearing. One is outside and one is inside. Mm -hmm. And it would seem to me that you might want to treat your businesses uniformly meaning all businesses, all establishments indoors have to, or not, whatever you choose. And then outdoors might be a little bit different because there is not a lot of pedestrian um, traffic um, out on that area of Stillwater. There are no sidewalks or, or things out there. That makes sense to so let me see what I can bring together. Um, my next question is, we are scheduled to have a um, council workshop on mo Monday. Um, we will not have adequate notice to hold a public hearing on Monday. 
Are you guys open for me moving the workshop into a special council meeting um, to do this? Um, I have an individual who wants to talk about universal health care. I'm going to explain to them that the, their item has been bumped until the September workshop, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Um, and so this will be a single item um, meeting because my sense is it will garner some public discussion. And I know that there are public members listening now and a couple of them wanted to make some comments, but I thought it was important that council kind of a chance to discuss it and kind of sit with it for a minute. So I would encourage those people to speak to us at the public hearing and I will talk to Belle or Sophie as to the logistics of how people will get to speak to us. Um, just so people know the current version of the draft is um, currently posted on the town website under council items of consideration so everybody has a chance to see it i will work with the council chair on a potential meeting date i have to get into contact with the bangor daily because that's the one we have to use and um, we will kind of proceed from there work for everybody yes great all right. Um, I had a dog come in, so I had lost my agenda, but I think it's at a brief town manager's update. So um, on my brief town manager's update, I think the, the thing I want to bring to your attention is that Joe's projects are kind of a mixed bag right now. Um, on the one hand, um, the Margin Street project went much better than we had anticipated. Granite and liner was able to line the pipe as opposed to um, having to dig it, which saved um, considerable amount of money. Unfortunately, the, um, the, the plans for Mill Street, um, while what they could feel <laughs> matched what was on the plan, when they dug it up, it was an elbow and not a Y. So they cracked the, they cut the elbow to get the um, camera up in and discovered that the sanitary sewer is connected within the foundation of the building. So we're gonna have to, we've um, paved everything over. We've set it up so it can be pulled apart again fairly easily. Um, but we're going to need to be working with the building owner on changing some internal plumbing and coring the foundation to reattach the sanitary sewer. Because the other thing we discovered is with nobody using the facilities, any water in the building, that uh, we had a little rainstorm and the water was gushing out of the pipe. So it is clearly a CSO contributor. Um, so we are going to um, where Joe is working with Mandy right now. We're going to go back to the table. We're going to close out the existing contract because um, because we um, that type of work um, has kind of been complete. They got all but this much done. So now the next um, the next contract that we're gonna need will take a different um, set of expertise. So as soon as I know more, I'll let you know. But as Joe says, when all of our associates came on and started to ensure that we had as built and good drawings and good notes from construction, it's made all the difference in the world. Unfortunately, this predates them. So um, we are gonna come up with a plan there. We, need to work there's a business there and with students coming back we're not sure when this is going to make sense for us to get in there because you're actually going to have to dig up part of the foundation so in from the inside so um that is the not so great news the good news is we got the sell, second healthy main um, grant for covid19 awareness which is wonderful um, we had asked for a little over 50,000. We were funded at the 30,000 level um, because we had already gotten one round of funding. So 
we're going to work with staff to reconfigure that grant and as soon as we figure out what we can expend and not we'll let you know um, and the really not so good news is that um, throughout the beginning of the pandemic um, the FEMA had been working with town staff to clearly you know to identify before we spent money we asked is this covered is this not going to be covered the things that were questionable or not covered we didn't put into our grant fund we found other ways to pay for it um, unfortunately we learned this week that um, guidance that we got around barriers and some other masks and things like that um, was not correct they've changed their mind and so it's last year's budget so right now i have got um, staff going through and pulling out anything that is not going to be covered because right now it's sitting in a grant fund and doesn't show as an expense to the general fund which it will be an expense to the general fund and i've got to capture it in last year's expense budget so that we're not in the hole moving forward so um, that might we might end up creating a um, separate budget called COVID-19 something to that effect and just put all the expenses there and then do a budget adjustment into that one to cover it because well I want to see the expenses when you're talking about a few few hundred dollars over expended that's one thing or staff time overtime over expended that's another thing but you know a seven hundred dollar budget line that you've spent twenty two hundred dollars out of because you were told that of those things that you were told were going to be reimbursed that are now not reimbursed i you know overspending to that degree is not cool so i want to find a way to track the covid 19 expenses and not lose them but also not look so out of whack so that's the not so great news but it's been a great day it's a gorgeous day um all right with that i think that we are at the end of our very long meeting um so do we i should know this but do we have one on thursday or we we do Hello, chicken. That's my favorite photo bomb ever so far. Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty good. I needed that after three hours. So, Sorry. just so you're aware, I haven't talked to the committee chair yet, but he's pretty agreeable. So, we've got um, community development committee on um, Thursday, and I've got um, some parks and rec stuff. We've got an ordinance amendment that if we make the amendment before. Um, in early September and expend the funds. We've got grant money from the city of Bangor to, to help um, with some signage at playgrounds around um, smoking. I think that's awesome. Let's take advantage of that. But we want to talk about it with the committee first so it doesn't just appear. Um, and, but that meeting would go from 4 to 5.30 at the latest because we've got an appeals hearing, appeals board hearing starting at 6. And I've got a bunch of new people new to the town's platform that I need Bell to be free to work with them on Zoom to make sure that we've got a good hearing. So we want to be able to start that meeting no later than 5.45 for people to jump onto and figure out their technical glitches. Um, so I would say if we say we're going to end at 530, we should be able to end no later than 545 by my math and um, kind of go from there. Sounds busy great. day. It's a busy week. Busy week. All right. With that, I will assume that all of you are in agreement that we can adjourn. Have a lovely dinner. See you soon. I'm leaving my office now. Thank you all.